morning, earlier morning than normal from uh, Bethesda. Um, hope everyone's well, uh, and I look forward to today's session, which is a reminder it's scheduled to go three hours, 15 minutes, um, and we'll, we'll, we, there are two important topics, fraud, fraud and audit evidence. Uh, and so uh, if we may definitely need the full three hours, 15 minutes, uh, if not just a little bit more. Uh, welcome to all of our observers too, who are following us on YouTube. Uh, uh, good morning to you as well. Uh, today, the first topic we're gonna tackle is, is our um, fraud investigations in terms of uh, the potential for standard setting activities in this area. A lot of information gathering has been happening in space and I, I'm really pleased with how much the work group has been doing to advance this topic rapidly. And so today, as I said, mentioned on Monday, I view the work that's being done reflects a lot of research and get information gathering and a sort of develop and work in hypotheses as we, we go along. So when we're ready to act in whatever is the appropriate way that we, we can move quickly. Uh, so thank you to the team uh, for, for progressing this so quickly. Um, I know it's one of our top public interest issues. Uh, Fiona, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to lead us through it. Uh, um, I hope that Santa has brought us some gifts throughout this project, as I see that you, you're, you're, you're leading his sleigh right now. Let's, let's see how we go. Um, thanks, Tom. And <clears throat> I can't begin to tell you how difficult it is to find a joke with fraud in it to kick us off but I have one, so just bear with me. A nice young man by the name of Pablo lives in a small town in Spain. The town's really small. There are some rich people, not a lot, but one of them is Pablo's neighbor, the doctor. Now this neighbor owns a tiny motel as well with his wife, which they have called the Spanish Inn. A couple of years ago, the motel mysteriously burnt down. The couple tried to file for insurance, but the inspectors suspected arson. And in fact, the couple got taken to court for attempted insurance fraud. I got it in there. The case lasts for months, in fact. And when finally the judge and the prosecutors get tired of it, they start to bring out all the stops. And suddenly, mid trial, the wife breaks down crying. She admits to burning down the motel so she and her husband could claim the insurance money. The town was shocked, never expecting the doctor of doing this. That's when it hits me. No one suspects the Spanish in physician. I also reflected <laughs> on the fable from, I think it was Toronto when Roger shared the fable of the, the donkey or the ass that had been thrown down the well and dirt getting heaped on it. And I came up with a fable as well that reminded me of the fraud project that we've been working on um, for a while now. And this fable is the crow and the pitcher. Now, a pitcher is not um, something that is necessarily used in everybody's vocabulary, but it's a water jug in other parts of the world is what I would call it. So there's a thirsty crow, which comes across this water jug or this pitcher. And uh, it had been full of water at some stage, but now there's only a little bit left. And when the crow puts his beak into the mouth of that jug or pitcher, he can't reach the water. He keeps trying and trying, and at last he comes up with an idea. He drops a pebble into the pitcher, and then he drops another pebble into the pitcher, and he keeps dropping pebbles into the pitcher, and soon the water rises all the way up to the top, and he's able to quench his thirst. So the lesson is that little by little does the trick, and if your first solution doesn't solve the problem, think of another solution. Keep trying until you get the answer. After all, it is better than doing nothing. And I suspect this is gonna be the journey that we have with fraud. Little by little, we add stones into the picture and come up with different solutions. I will start by thanking the working group. Uh, Julie, Len, Imran and Fabian have been on the working group with myself. And also a very big thank you to Bev, No Visa Needed Bellman for her leadership on this project. And a special mention to the outstanding work that Angela has done on this as well. And you'll get to hear from Angela shortly. Um, so you'll see what I mean when I say Angela is outstanding. 
Um, I do want to talk through a few introductory slides before I hand over to Angela. So if we just move to the next slide, whoever has control of the slides, there we go. Um, this is an overview really just to set the scene and remind the board members that this really is a bit of an update on where we uh, have got to so far around um, the topic of fraud. It's not the complete solution. It's not the full solution for fraud. We haven't preempted any solutions. We're not prejudging any other solutions either. There will still be a lot more, I'm sure, that gets added to the project before we even get to the project proposal stage um, in 2021. What I would say, however, there, though, that there are some issues or um, considerations that we know already exist with extent ISA 240. And we've heard about those for a while now. So in addition to the update that um, we'll talk you through on what we've been doing since we last spoke to you, we have provided in the issues paper some of those known issues and the working group's preliminary ideas or preliminary responses that could be used to address those. Again, not a solution, not preempting, but we certainly would appreciate um, people's views to help us move forward as a working group on those issues. So this is really just the working group trying to demonstrate some of our thinking around those known issues. If we move to the next slide, you may recall the last time we spoke about fraud, Angela in particular had done a lot of work looking at academic research and then we also held various roundtables. And as I explained, we've um, had a working group, a uh, couple of working group meetings now where we did some brainstorming around those known issues with extent. 240. So you'll see there, there's a number of inputs and you'll see other, maybe we should have made the other a lot bigger, but there is still obviously more input to come. Um, I am going to hand off to Angela in a second for the next two slides. Um, before I do hand that over, I did also want to mention that we have also met with the CAG and the minutes are included in the issues paper. Um, we don't have a specific slide for it in, in this paper, but I just wanted to acknowledge that the CAG have provided input at this early stage also, which has been really helpful. Um, and I'm assuming Jim doesn't have any comments given that the minutes are in the paper, but um, we'll just pause for a second in case he did want to say anything. Thanks, Fiona, for that opportunity to, to make a comment or two. And I think there were two, uh, two points that, that I took out of the CAG meeting. I just wanted to reiterate with everyone. Um, <clears throat> One is, uh, one was uh, the, the idea or the consideration of some sort of stand back provision. And when I say stand back, it's, it would be in the case where you have, you look at the environment and, and is there any um, conflicting information if, if the uh, company is saying X and, and, and the rest of the world is saying Y. Um, maybe that would be a consideration. And, and some of the examples that were referenced were financial analysts, which were saying that there was um, fraud or something within the company uh, and, and, and they weren't even the auditors. So, so that was the one example. And the, the other is, is really related also to that stand back provision, but just consider uh, what some of these most recent frauds have been, whether they be business frauds or accounting frauds, and, and we all know some of those cases, um, what would be effective or if anything in, in the auditor's work that would have identified that, that potential fraud. And, and so that was the other lift from the group. Thank you, Fiona. No problem, thanks, Jim, appreciate it. Um, Angela, I might pass to you if you'd like to talk to the next um, the next two slides, please. Sure, thank you. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so we just wanted to highlight um, a couple things on this slide here in terms of additional outreach performed and planned. Um, in the issues paper that we provided, there is a table that summarizes um, many of the outreach discussions that we've already had. Um, but since posting of the board papers, we've we've actually um, had a couple additional meetings uh, specifically with the investor groups. Um, we had one meeting with the South Africa Cruft meet with the South Africa Corporate Reporting Users Forum and, and one with the UK um, similar group um, of investors. 
And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that we heard um, in those meetings from, from those groups. Um, participants didn't tend to focus on a need for specific changes to the audit standards in the meetings that we had, uh, but they were very focused on the idea that a cultural change is needed by all players in the financial reporting ecosystem. Uh, they also talked about how there's a need for improved engagement between audit committees and auditors on the topics of fraud and going concern, um, but you know, specific to fraud for purposes of this meeting. Um, uh, participants were very open to more transparency in the auditor's report, but stressed that they didn't just want to add more for the purpose of adding more, um, only wanted uh, tailored bespoke sort of non-boilerplate information um, that would be useful for them. Um, some participants alluded to the need for more in the area of internal controls. Um, including the need for both management and auditors to do more in the area of internal controls. And then lastly, um, some participants cautioned that while more can always be added, the work effort must still be proportionate to the purpose of an audit of financial statements and not venture into something beyond that. Um, and proportionality is also something that we discuss um, in our discussion paper and you know, that we'll be considering as we progress forward. Uh, so that really just gives a summary of what we heard in those in those meetings with the investor groups. We do also have um, some scheduled outreach uh, happening in February of 2021 with the Tapestry Networks Audit Committee um, representatives, and also uh, we'll be scheduling additional outreach meetings once we do receive um, comment letters uh, towards the beginning of February um, with some of the some of the groups that we've already met with. Um, so we'll, we'll do, be doing continued outreach with those groups as well. If we can move to the next slide. Um, so this slide we just wanted to highlight. Um, so the FRC came out with their consultation on the proposed revision of the UK auditing standard ISA UK 240. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that that is something that we're looking at. A lot of the changes that were made um, are topics that we discuss in our discussion paper or that we had talked about in our working group brainstorm. So a lot of um, the issues and, and um, changes are things that uh, overlap with the work that we're doing. There are a couple that um, are a little, a little different than um, what we've explicitly called out in our discussion paper. So we'll certainly be looking at those along with all of the other changes as we progress our work and as we get responses to the DP. But we thought it would just be helpful to highlight those couple that, that aren't explicitly called out in some of our other work, which was uh, the requirement for the auditor to remain alert to conditions that indicate a record or document may not be authentic. Um, and the requirement for, for the auditor to inquire with those responsible for dealing with allegations of fraud. Um, but, but a lot of the other changes are um, topics that we do explore in the DP. And so as we, as we get responses back, um, you know, we'll be looking at the changes um, made in, in the UK, as well as, you know, obviously the, um, the, the responses to the discussion paper and, and our general monitoring of reviews performed in other jurisdictions as we, as we progress this work. Um, so with that, um, Fiona, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Maybe we can move to the next slide and, and start going through the questions. Great. Without further ado, let's get into it. There's a number of um, questions that we will work our way through, and most of you are following along. If you are in the agenda item, you'll see the table where we've outlined the issues. In the first one, I wanted to get reactions or comments from, um, from board members relates to the rebuttal of presumed risk of material misstatement due to fraud in revenue recognition. And you'll see there, we've included in the table a very high level summary of the comments that we received, possible actions, and I know there are only crosses in columns, but possible actions with um, some additional, um, I guess, colour and commentary on the far right hand side, just covering off some of the um, discussion points and preliminary views that as a working group we have been discussing. But as I said, this isn't um, this isn't trying to demonstrate that we've made answers or made decisions. Um, this is really just a, a, an update of where thinking and initial thinking as a working group has got to and we would really appreci appreciate um, reactions and responses from the board members. So with that, Tom, I will pass back to you. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, the, I just wanted to highlight that 
the working group uh, is really trying to get input from beyond just the normal suspects, I would say, or the Com normal commentators for this go really pushing hard to the practitioner uh, beyond the practitioner community to investors to those charged with governance uh, to leverage other jurisdictions uh, efforts in this regard too I know there was a series of meetings in South Africa which we've received the input from too so I think that's really important as we think about the public interest in this domain too. Not that we don't do it on other projects, but I, I note the intensive efforts on this and going concern. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I, I, I take comments on the first point on the rebuttal of presumed risk uh, material misstatement due to fraud and revenue recognition. Uh, Josephine? Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for all the hard work that's gone into this. Clearly, so much going on in the background, and I know because I've been involved in a couple of the webinars already, we've achieved so much in this information gathering. It's really uh, remarkable. So all credit to, to you and the team on this, and of course, Bev and Angela. Um, on, I also totally understand that this is just um, preliminary views and, and it's exploring and I, and I think that's the right thing to do. I think exploring is right and I think we should be open to all ideas. So I'm um, totally on board with, with most of these preliminary views, if not all of them, just a couple of things to add really. So in respect to number one, um, I do agree it's not the public interest to remove the presumed risk, but I do wonder if it's possible for the working group to explore the idea that the focus on revenue recognition alone might actually result in perhaps insufficient attention being given to other ways fraud might be perpetrated. So that might be in the case of say property valuations, inventory, and some of those other areas that we see fraud occurring. So I'm not suggesting right now we set out a long list of additional robustable presumptions at all, but if you could, when you're doing or exploring and pulling together your project proposal, if you could have a think about that. And, and I agree with both the, both the targeted changes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, Sachka? Thank you, Tom, and, and thank you very much um, for uh, a wonderful work. I also echo it's very, it must be very hard work to, you know, uh, gather a lot of such information at this stage. So thank you very much. And with regard to uh, this theme, I also um, agree with the working group's view that it is not in the public interest to remove the presumed risk of material misstatement due to fraud in revenue recognition. But maybe it's a perhaps a little bit related to what Josephine said, but more generally, I believe that the auditor needs to appropriately respond to fraud risk relates to not only uh, revenue recognition, but other accounts and transaction. But I heard that there are cases that auditors too much focus on revenue recognition than other areas because there is a presumed risk of revenue recognition. So although I agree to retain the presumption of fraud risk on revenue recognition, um, my idea is I think perhaps there should be some flexibility in the level of procedures. Um, for example, I think the auditor should perform more enhanced procedures when the auditor identifies an indication of fraud in revenue recognition. I therefore think it would be helpful if the standard clarify that appropriate procedure on the presumed risk on fraud in revenue recognition depends on the level of fraud risk. For example, the standard can clarify by differentiating the procedure for revenue recognition when there is no indication fraud and when there is an indication. This clarification will help the auditors to allocate their resources appropriately, which will alleviate the issue I stated. And I also think this clarification will help in addressing the issue of inappropriate rebuttal. There are cases that auditors inappropriately rebut the presumption to avoid very rigid procedures. So if the auditor can determine appropriate procedure based on the fraud level uh, relevant to revenue recognition, I think it will reduce the cases that auditor inappropriately rebut the presumption. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Sachiko. Um, because I've got antlers on, it means I've got two heads, I'm doing two roles. Tom's just stepped away for a second. Um, it 
those comments, Sachiko and Josephine, thank you. You have reminded me. It was remiss of me at the start if there were, um, if you were willing to share the comments that you share now on public record, or if you have them prepared in writing, please just share them as well. There'll be a, a transition from me off the working group and another working group chair taking over. So I think as much as we can have it documented, um, because I'm terrible at taking notes, um, that would be really helpful. So if you're prepared to or able to share them offline as well to um, Bev and Angela, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So next in line was Chun Wei. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona um, and, and Angela for the introductory comments. And Fiona, I'm going to miss all your jokes. Um, you know, I think this is probably the, one of the last time we're going to see you chair a, a session. Um, but back to the topic, um, again, kudos to the, yourself, Angela, and the working group for the tremendous amount of work done, including the three really, really excellent um, roundtables. Um, just wanted to come in very quickly on this. Um, first of all, I want to support what um, Josephine and Pachika have said. They're very well articulated points. Um, I'm just looking at this point, and, and I'm, I'm, I must say I was quite surprised to see that the feedback from stakeholders have been focused on rebutter rather than proper assessment of the fraud risk and how you actually deal with the fraud risk relating to revenue recognition. And I think it's quite telling where the time and energy for some practitioners have been in terms of where they've invested all those time. Um, and, and I did see it in practice as well. So when 240, this new requirement came up, um, I saw a lot of teams actually just you know, paying a lot of attention to how they can actually effectively rebut the presumed fraud risk rather than really thinking about you know, where those risks are and how do you actually assess it. So I just wonder um, whether we should also think more about ways we can perhaps shift the attention from rebuttal to proper fraud risk assessment. And I think some of what um, Sachiko and Josephine um, have shared um, would also be helpful as well. So I just want to come in very quickly to make that observation. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you, Chan Wei. Um, Fernando? Thanks, Fiona, and thanks to the task force for the papers. Uh, very easy to read. Um, I enjoyed them a lot. I, I think it's really difficult to object that most of the issues is really what we face in practice, and especially this number one, I think it's really the top and, and where we struggle every day. Um, I, I see a lot of inconsistency, uh, especially in this item, across the firms, the regions, the countries, even, um, even the, the same firms having different approaches, uh, the definition of fraud in revenue being too general, then responses being too general, others more detailed at the assertion level with specific procedures. But at the end, the big question is really how much do you really need to do to overcome this presumption and, and conclude that you have that sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. That, that's where we struggle a lot. And, um, and, and I think that sometimes we practitioners find an easy solution and we just take it for granted without doing a more detailed analysis. I think we, we need to recognize that across the, the world, different countries, different type of industries, uh, even size of companies, risk of companies, the, the, the recognition of revenue works sometimes a little bit different. Um, sometimes groups, uh, send instructions saying revenue recognition is not a fraud risk and, and suddenly you have that fraud risk for statutory purposes and then you still have inconsistencies or it could be the opposite. And, and, and this issue is really, um, I think, creating a lot of ineffective and inefficiencies in terms of the work and the execution. And it would be, it would be really good to have some clarity on what needs to be done. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Fernando. Uh, Kai Morton. Um, thank you. Um, um, I agree with uh, a lot of the comments that have been made so far. And uh, I think what we see in practice is uh, a lot of uh, auditors going in uh, with the intention of the seeking how to rebut the risk, as, uh, as uh, Chang Wei said as well, uh, that they, instead of um, focusing on assessing the risk properly and then uh, see what the risk really is and deciding the what procedures can be done to address those risks specifically in detail they go in with a too general view so um, 
how we can address that in the standard, I think would be good to look at because that's some of the pain points that I see. Um, but I also agree with the, some of the way forward that the task force has presented on this. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Uh, Eric? Thanks, Tom and, and um, Fiona and, and the working group. Thank you very much for the, the analysis and uh, work that's being done in this area. Obviously a very high uh, priority item across the globe and a lot of people are spending a lot of time on these issues. Um, on this particular one, uh, like others, um, you know, the feedback that we are getting is that um, a, a lot of auditors are spending a lot of time worrying about the presumption and not spending enough time looking for the risks or identifying the risks. So, uh, you know, my initial reaction to this is that we should not um, assume automatically that having a rebuttable presumption um, or, or put it the other way uh, that, that removing the rebuttable presumption is not in the public interest. I think what is not in the public interest is auditors wasting their time considering whether they need to rebut a presumption. What they should be spending their time on as, as others have said is identifying the risks, uh, looking for the pressures and incentives and appropriately uh, designing their audit procedures. So I think, I think um, we should keep an open mind about what is the appropriate way forward uh, for in this area uh, and, and not uh, assume that we have to retain this presumption. I know that when it was originally um, implemented uh, back in whenever it was, that it was really because there had been a lot of frauds around revenue recognition. Um, and so there was a sound basis, I guess, at that time for making that decision. I guess the question in my mind is whether we need to get more evidence around whether this is still the case. Um, and just as, as, as a further point is, is that we've done quite a bit of looking at academic research in, in the area of fraud as part of, part of our work in this area. And one of the things that we've learned is research seems to indicate that auditors are quite, are good at identifying fraud risks. What they're not necessarily so good at is designing the appropriate responses to those fraud risks. And so I think that could be part of the symptoms here with the uh, revenue recognition area is that um, they're not spending the time to really look at what the fraud risks are in revenue recognition. And so whatever their procedures are may be somewhat um, superficial or um, perfunctory. And so I think, I think we just need to rethink that uh, approach. Thank you. Thanks. Eric, uh, Isabel. Yes. Um, so I think we all know why uh, these presumed risks landed into our auditing standards. Uh, it first started by SAS 99, and I'm sure Dan Montgomery, if he's uh, around, uh, will remember. And then it also arrived um, in ISA 240. And it's exactly for the reasons that Eric has just highlighted, because some of the big fraud that occurred uh, in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, were around revenue recognition. So there was a real focus on that. Uh, when we discussed to prepare this meeting, uh, many people had in mind uh, more recent fraud that were not um, frauds linked to um, uh, doing an intentional presentation of the financial statements, but more um, frauds dealing with uh, misappropriation of assets. And it's quite interesting to see that the people that had this uh, more recent fraud in mind uh, had the idea that maybe we should have um, uh, over 
uh, presumed risks of fraud, maybe like what um, Josephine uh, mentioned initially. And, for, and many of them mentioned, for example, should we do something more on cash because of these recent examples of uh, misappropriation of assets. Uh, so we, we, we did not conclude, but it was necessary, but at least many people thought that uh, there was too much focus on revenue recognition. And maybe uh, this was like the tree uh, who is hiding the forest and we are missing uh, some of our risks that should be important to identify. And um, I'm, the feedback is also very similar to the one that Fernando has highlighted, is that uh, uh, auditors often are requested to spend too much time when they really need to review that risk. Uh, and sometimes it's so obvious that just one sentence, when you know the business, when you know the activity, just one sentence would be enough. Uh, but due to the focus that there is around this presumed risk and um, the documentation of the rebuttal, uh, often you spend unnecessary time rebutting that and not the necessary time investigating on, on some other risks. And um, based on um, the table and uh, the, this point, which is described on page eight of 39, uh, I did not really get why there was a cross in the standard setting requirement column. Um, I understand that uh, at this stage, the proposal are more to clarify. So if it's to clarify, uh, maybe application material would be sufficient. And I was not very clear at what we would change uh, in the requirement. Thank you. Hey, I'll just jump in there and say we haven't we haven't decided, Isabel. It was just one of the options that maybe a requirement would need to be revised or enhanced to deal with this. So um, it wasn't meant to be clear as to what exactly we we were suggesting. Miles away from drafting. Thanks. And Fiona, sometimes a subtle change in requirement, even though fundamental, could draw attention to it. So yeah, we could get the clarity that we're we're hearing is needed in this area. Um, Roger. Yeah, th thanks, Tom. A and thanks, Fiona and Angela. And uh, let me drop my little pebble into the jug as well. Um, so um, I'm, I'm probably a little bit with, with Eric. I, I'm, I, I suppose I don't think we're in a situation where we could remove the rebuttal um, because I don't think we have the evidence in order to do that. Um, I struggle to identify exactly, you know, where the frauds are occurring, where they're being identified, uh, and what procedures are helping in those particular areas. We keep on hearing um, that auditors, experienced auditors, have a good knowledge, but there is no systematic capturing of this area of this of this good knowledge uh, and sharing. Uh, so it would be very beneficial if we could capture and do that. The academic research I've looked at, uh, I, I agree with Eric, but it doesn't really help take us forward to put us in a situation to, to, to inform us in this particular area. So if we could capture some of that information as to you know, where frauds are being identified, um, that will allow us a, a better uh, understanding of you know, what types of things we should be suggesting. Um, it, it doesn't appear to be there at the moment. Uh, if, it, if it is, if it's, if it's captured within firms and if it can be shared across standard setters, I'm, I'm not seeing it as a national standard setter and I am pushing for it uh, because I think it will add to, a, add to an informed discussion. Uh, so I don't think we're in a situation to remove it, um, but I would like to see more evidence uh, aimed at uh, trying, trying to identify what would be the areas where we should be concentrating in the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Rich? Thanks, Tom. Um, and thanks to the uh, working group. Uh, thanks, Fiona, for uh, laying it out so well, as well as Angela. Um, it was a good paper. I really enjoyed uh, reading it. Um, uh, first, I want to just talk a little bit about what, what I've heard so far, because I, I agree with a lot what's been said. Um, I agree with Roger and Eric on, on the point that Roger just said about uh, we need to have more information. 
um, again, why we did this originally, there was a, there was a case or cases. Uh, I don't believe we can take it out. So that's not the reason to, but I think we need to be able to have the, the basis to be able to stay with it. And very much like uh, Josephine and Sajiko, um, it quite easily could be that there are other things that are coming up for fraud that we should also be looking at. Again, not necessarily saying rebuttable, but, but um, bringing out why they need to look at other areas of the, um, of the balance sheet or operations, whether that's valuations or, 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 or other things. Um, I also think this is an area that, uh, you know, th there's not a lot of consistency in what I've seen. And I have worked around the world. Um, different, different industries look at this differently. Uh, I can tell you the financial services industry, you know, um, several years ago, holistically, just believed it didn't apply to them. You know, I think there's been a lot of focus, especially at the firms, to, to, to reinvigorate this process. But, but I do wonder how consistent that is throughout the, uh, the firms overall and, and, and definitely worldwide. Um, so to me, part of the reason, you know, keeping it, but I really believe we need to clarify. And again, that may be what Tom just said, maybe there's a tweak in, this, in the requirement, but, but, but definitely to me in the application material to, you know, what's really getting here and what you, what you need to look at. Um, you know, one of the, uh, uh, areas that we always have a hard time at is, you know, we've now focused down on the assertion level and the streams of, of, of revenue. Uh, but again, then what happens with those, if you say the ones that are relevant are, are, are accuracy and, and recording, and, and so you're focusing on that, well, what about the other ones? You've just said they're not relevant, but you know, we've had feedback from regulators that say, well, that means you're rebutting the other ones. And, and I'm not necessarily sure that's what we're trying to get at. Uh, so again, I do think there's a lot of work on this on, on how we can clarify it um, to, to make a more consistent approach globally uh, to this. Uh, I do believe way too many people rebut this presumption uh, and, and much more than what, even what you have in the paper. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Rich. So. Thank you. Um, thanks, Fiona and, and the task force. There's some really interesting material in there. Um, I felt Fernando summed up some of the practical challenges incredibly eloquently. Um, so I'd like to sort of reinforce a, a lot of what he said there. Um, I think, you know, clearly it's not in the public interest to, to remove this kind of requirement. But I think in, in practice, in some jurisdictions, some industries, whatever, we have lost some of the why this is important. And I think it's I think that's going to be critical to um, to anything that we build in is, is to make sure that people understand why this consideration is is so important um, and then within that so that it then doesn't become just a kind of routine thing to be done um, so I think you know for me clearly there's there's a lot of um, opportunity for guidance and support in the areas around um, where this is really you know really particularly important and actually perhaps recognizing um, the, the times when it, it might be appropriate to rebut, um, but providing those kind of um, much clearer guardrails. So um, that's uh, my initial thoughts. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Tom and, and Fiona, uh, Angela, Bab, all uh, great job here. I, I guess, um, you know, my concern here, I, I agree with, I think, the, the uh, majority of, of views here, which is it's probably not appropriate or really um, feasible to remove the requirement at this point in time. But um, kind of picking up, I think, a little bit on Rich, what he uh, talked about is it, it seems as though whenever we have a presumption like this, uh, there's, there's two paths that that tend to be bad ones to go down. Uh, one is you take, uh, auditors will take a blanket approach to a rebuttal. So whether it's industry sector approach or whatever, and, and it almost gets to be the, the pre-formatted canned memos uh, for the rebuttal. Uh, the other side of it though, is there are other auditors who will uh, take the path of least resistance and say, I'm not going to work hard on a rebuttal but then they develop a very standardized routine set of procedures that they do to address 
all, you know, fraud risk and revenue recognition across all assertions, across all revenue streams, uh, things like that. So I guess, I, you know, I'm, I'm open, I would be open to considering how we might tweak the requirement or look at the standard. But I really think the key here is maybe based on some of the research that Eric and, and uh, Roger referred to, is to drill down into the specifics in today's world. You know, where do these risks really uh, come from? Uh, where are they manifesting themselves? And I think when you look at, um, you know, remembering another aspect of our fraud work is around the unpredictability of procedures and things like that. I just, I, I have a feel that this presumption has been here long enough now that the, the uh, unpredictability element is hard to achieve. And actually, uh, management and, and uh, others responsible for this have <laughs> gone through this uh, so many times that they kind of know what the auditor is going to do also. So I, I think, you know, again, uh, probably not appropriate to remove the requirement at this point, but um, drilling down to get more specific in a better reaction or response would be uh, desired. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, and Lynn. Lynn, you're on mute. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think at this stage, I'm probably with everybody else that we um, need to keep the presumption of fraud. But I think um, I agree, particularly with those people who talked about robust risk assessment. And I also particularly agree with the last sentence of the dot point on page eight, which says, when rebuttal is appropriate, the rationale must be clear and adequately documented. And I think that's vital in terms of consistency. Um, I'd also like to pick up on Josephine's point about taking a wider view than just revenue. Um, I think that's critical. The New Zealand public sector fraud has been um, recorded for the last eight years and about 25% of it is theft of cash, about 9% is expense claims, 9% credit cards and 9% false invoicing. And so that's quite a broad range of things and coming next down is theft of assets. So looking at some of that um, kind of research, which is, um, and the trends over time of that research, I think is important, not only to look at um, more detail, as Bob was saying about um, revenue recognition, but what are the other frauds that are present or building? Thanks, Tom. Fiona, uh, that's, the full round right now. I, I turn it back to you. Thank you. And thank you for all of the comments. Just a couple of comments before we move on. Um, I, I did want to make it clear that, uh, or just remind everyone last time when we presented and, and Angela and Bev probably spoke as well. Um, Angela has spent a lot of her life this year reading academic research. And when I say hundreds of articles, it's not an exaggeration. So there's a really good starting point as a body of evidence of you know, where there are themes and things that we're seeing coming out of that academic research, which I think will be really helpful as we move forward. Um, my observation from a firm perspective is there's typically two key areas when it comes to fraud and it, they're typically the ones where litigation is, is taken because obviously firms have insurance and it tends to be overstatement of revenue and therefore profit um, and also overstatement of assets. They're the two big ones that, um, that seem to crop up regularly but certainly acknowledge that um, you know, other sectors like public sector, for example, will have, um, have unique challenges. And, uh, and Sue, I like your suggestion of, you know, why is really important. And I, I wonder whether this is another, if we're going to open up the standard, this is another one right for maybe some of the drafting conventions we used in 315, where we were very clear on what the requirement was and then included 
um, which, is, it, which is hard to write, but the why those requirements are there to try and expand in the application material. And it may be something as simple as enhancing the why piece um, that might help with that. So we're going to move on to the next one. And in the interest of time, because I absolutely don't want to steal any time from the other topic that we're talking about today, we're going to take the next two together. So I know they're big parts of the table, but I'm, I'm hoping that um, we'll be able to work through them reasonably quickly. The first one is around um, the extent of journal entry testing required. And I'm pretty sure there'll be some strong views on this as well. And then um, the next slide, if we could just show that as well, is this, the three one, which is around all the supplemental audit requirements in other jurisdictions. And I know there's a lot to work through, but I'm hoping that we can group together some of these just to, to keep on track, given that we um, I think we've only got about half an hour left to get through the rest of this paper. Uh, if you've got detailed comments, though, as I said, please um, provide them uh, offline to us as well, because the more detail we have and the more information we have to put into this would be really helpful. Back to you, Tom. Okay, uh, journal entry, uh, journal entries and uh, uh, supplemental audit requirements are the two topics for comments right now. Anyone brave enough to put their hand up? Fernando. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Fiona, this journal entry testing is also another area that I think works very well to do the what, to do the um, why, to do the how, and even the when, because that's where we really get lost. A lot of inconsistencies in practice. Uh, a lot of teams tend to do it the whole year. They don't really know why, but they just do it the whole year. Completeness of the journal entry is another big issue. Others just ticking five um, journal entries. I've seen teams where, that end up with um, 1,500 journal entries. Of course, something went wrong, absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's really nonsense to be doing that amount of testing. And, and, and that inconsistency, again, leads to inefficiencies and effectiveness. At the end, the objective is not really achieved. And, and, and if we fail here, probably there's a bigger risk that something could be wrong in the financial statements and we are not even picking that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Josephine. Uh, thank you. I am um, just listening to Fernando. I don't really have any additional points on the general entries, but I do agree with him with the what, why, how and when, which I think you've pretty much covered in some of your suggestions, but um, that's a neat way to summarise them. Thank you, Fernando. Um, I just want to say on 3A, I do support the working group looking further into the extended requirements in Japan. I'm particularly keen to understand more about those quality control aspects and um, have point on that a bit later on but uh, the work expected around the additional procedures and I think some of that speaks to a lot of the comments we've already the board have already made on point one and on uh, point 3b um, in my view I think more can definitely be done around the discussion of the engagement team but at the moment potentially it seems to be fixed at one point in the audit that iteration and that regular catch-up and discussion could really feature much more in our standards and perhaps it's not just about you know having a full discussion at one point in time um, and but it's throughout the audit and maybe think about um, some of that additional flavor again exploring some of that additional flavor in the standard or in in terms of non-authoritative guidance but um, yeah I do think that's a, an area to focus on thank you thank you Josephine Chun -Li. Thank you, Tom. Um, and just very quickly on, on journal entry, um, I agree with the observations and, and the proposed way forward. Um, the only point I was going to make um, have been very well articulated by Fernando already, which is that yeah, especially the why. I, I think the inconsistency in, in terms of how practices have been doing it um, is because people are just doing it for the sake of doing it. So, so I think emphasizing the why will help people sort of crystallize their thinking a little bit and perhaps be, be more targeted. Um, so I'll strongly encourage us um, doing more around that. Um, the only other point I want to make is, um, is, is a question uh, really is on 3A on the on Japanese edition um, and in the second bullet point where they say that in, when the auditor identify during the audit circumstances that indicate possibility of material misstatement due to fraud. Uh, and then there's a reference to Appendix 2. Um, and, and, and my question is, is this a similar 
kind of a um, similar list to what we have in 240 Appendix 3, or is it a different kind? I imagine it will be a little bit more targeted um, and specific, but it would be good to know um, the reason, if it's different from 240, the reason um, for the change um, in, in this Japanese standard and has the approach been effective so far in Japan? So it, it, it was really a question. Um, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Sachita? Thank you. Um, with regard to a question to uh, journal entry testing, um, I think um, guidance is helpful because I have heard the view that practitioner think that testing is not as effective considering the amount of time and effort required. So I think there is a need for why it's necessary and some guidance. And with regard to uh, question 3A, maybe I need to answer Chung Wen's question. But first of all, I just want to share that um, I found the research uh, in Japan that surveyed the practitioner's perception and the effect of uh, our fraud risk standard based on the two year experience after the implementation of the standard. And based on that research, 55% uh, of the response were positive with some comment on the cost implication. And remaining 45% remaining include there were no substantial effect as the standards just stated what had already been in practice, which was around 22%. So I think therefore the standard is generally perceived to be effective. And I believe there are certain requirements that could be worth being considered by IWSB. So I'm very happy to uh, continue to coordinate with Bev and Angela to contribute to the board discussion. And also uh, with regard to uh, Chung Wei's point about uh, Appendix 2 versus Appendix 3, um, it's a bit different list. But what we had is that our new list includes something that is more, you know, possible that there is really a fraud. And therefore, if you find that that um, matter that is included in our new list, you need to deep dive and do more tests. That's our uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rich? Um, thanks, Tom. Um, so I just, let me just get to my stuff, okay. Um, so on journal entry, um, I, I think just like before, I think uh, more guidance would help here. Um, you know, I know um, within, within my network, there's a lot of work that's been done over the last few years, uh, including uh, bringing in, um, you know, data analytics into how to, how to help this and, and, and other technology tools. Um, and, you know, so I wonder in that guidance, we can maybe get what's best practice out there to, to help others to approach this. Um, one thing that we've found and I found is that uh, sort of the su success or failure you're gonna have on journal entry testing is, is how well the team's risk assessment, so mm -hmm. Fiona, risk assessment, you know, how, how well that's done. And if you've done that well, then you can understand how to draw and drill down and, and, and get something that's worthwhile. If you don't do it, then you're, you're, you're finding yourself with way too much to look at and, 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 the, and then the work just isn't done well. Um, so I think, uh, you know, some more guidance on this would be very helpful. Um, some of the section talked about um, uh, the substantive uh, procedures and um, uh, the testing overlap point that I was in the paper. And, and I was just wondering whether that might be better placed uh, for the LCE uh, group to look at. Um, it's not that it doesn't apply to everyone else, but it clearly applies to the LCE uh, uh, area. Uh, on the Japanese standard, um, again, maybe, uh, you know, and Sajiku might want to deal with this, I don't know, but, you know, to me, um, how well has this done post you know, being out there? You know, so the feedback on, on the actual uh, uh, findings and, and you know, to me, the question of it's, um, you know, how long do we need to actually see that it's actually working in practice and, and that they've actually changed behaviors and it's it really uh, uncovered things or is it um, uh, just that the language there maybe has made it uh, more front and center. Um, I know we as a board have talked many times about just um, using the word uh, professional skepticism in the standard and that in of itself does not change anything. 
especially as we looked at earlier um, uh, this week, that um, uh, a lot of people don't actually ever get into the standard. They get into methodology and therefore they're not necessarily going to, to see those, those words. Um, the, um, the stuff that we talked about on the quality review uh, reviewer, um, and you know, I wrote it and now I'm thinking, you know, to me that this would be dealt with ISQM2, but on the other hand, ISQM2 isn't rolled out yet. So maybe, maybe it would deal with it um, over, over time. But again, I'm not sure it would, would, would necessarily help us to put an additional requirement in there if ISQM2 is, is done appropriately. Um, on the forensic uh, specialists, um, you know, this is an area that, you know, I, I've seen here in the Netherlands um, where we've added um, uh, procedures for audits uh, to, to have forensics in early, uh, in, in the middle and in at the end, and, you know, mainly on the bigger audits, but, you know, and it, it really does help. Uh, there's no question it helps. Um, but what I'm worried about is not the big audits in the big cities, uh, it, it's everyone else. And how many uh, forensic auditors can you really have? Um, and, 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 you know, how will that be able to be used in, in, in uh, other locations and, and smaller uh, territories and smaller offices? And um, so, you know, I worry about that. And I also worry, uh, you know, um, we need to really, uh, maybe even when, when you put this out for exposure, um, ask the question to clients, are they, do they understand that, you know, this is an important thing, but it's gonna increase your cost. There's no question these are specialists. And that's an added cost that's gonna really you know, take up the, uh, the whole uh, cost of the audit. Um, comment on uh, uh, management override. Um, uh, again, what I was wondering, you know, we've just done 540 and 315. And again, I understand 315 um, isn't um, in place yet, but 540 is, in, is for this year. And so I'm not sure um, about the uh, comment about designing procedures, overall assertions on estimates and revenue, since we really focused on those standards to focus down to those factors as to really what's the, the root cause. So again, maybe it's where in the past those weren't there yet. So, but I think the solution is, is the enhanced standards that we've just done. Um, unpredictability, um, you know, and I, I I know it was mentioned a little earlier. I always have a hard time with this. You know, I look at a step, I review it, and I just go, what am I really getting out of this? Uh, or, or are we just doing this because it's said to be a good thing to do? Um, but are we really going to find material fraud through this unpredictability? What I've ended up seeing is minor fraud or minor, you know, hey, expense return, expense report was done incorrectly or something but I really haven't ever seen where this has got us to where we really need on material fraud. Um, I think there was one, uh, so uh, Fiona, I wasn't sure on um, uh, theme five, are you asking for something on that? Or will it be? I haven't got past um, three yet. So okay. two and three was what we were focused on. And I'm actually wondering in the interest of time, I know we've got a number of names still to go, um, maybe we could make it, if you have a fatal flaw or concern with what the task force is proposing for any of these areas, then we'd like to hear that. Because all of the other comments that you're making, they're valuable. We just don't have time to get all of them on the public record. So if you could provide them to us offline, that would be really helpful input because we're at really early stages. I mean, Rich, you just talked about exposure draft. We are miles away from that. We're trying to get reactions to our initial thinking as a working group. So maybe if there are fatal flaws, that would be really helpful to hear. Back to you, Tom. Yeah, so thank you, Fiona, for intervening there. I, I was going to say the same thing. We have 20 minutes on this, and I, unfortunately, we don't have much flexibility in today's agenda. Uh, so again, fatal flaws, major points to be raised, uh, detailed comments could be provided uh, offline. Uh, so next, Yosh. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I have just two comments about the uh, about the fraud standards. At first, I have to appreciation as a regulator 
Uh, we, we want to express our appreciation for the detailed introduction of Japan's fraud standards. And uh, in addition to this summary, Japan's fraud standards also include the response to material misstatement mis due to fraud at the audit firm level. For this reason, it may be helpful in addressing not only 240, but also QM2 standards. This is mentioned by Josephine, maybe. And uh, I understand that this is an issue which needs ongoing consideration, but it seems that the key, key issue is the degree of professional skepticism when it is required at two stage with maintain stage and ex exercising stage. This issues paper tries to introduce the new concept of suspicious mindset to change the content of the auditor's due care, which must be exercised. But I believe that it is effective to consider how to enhance the exercise of professional skepticism that is already established concept in current practice. So we emphasize that that skepticism should be maintained and exercised and requires to enhance the skepticism in the selection and application of audit procedures in response to the suspicion of material misstatement due to the fraud. So including three stages in other words, whether skepticism is exercised or not can be assessed by whether procedure, procedures are added or not, I think. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Eric. Thanks, Tom. Um, so overall, no fatal flaws in uh, what's been set out in the papers. I like the balanced approach that you're you're trying to take with all of the different issues. The only thing I'd like to emphasize is I think um, is in respect of some of these areas, we need to bring in the other stakeholders that have a role to play in the fraud uh, prevention and detection uh, role, whether it's the audit committee or the or management's uh, internal control procedures. Uh, I'd like to see more emphasis there if we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sue? Uh, thanks. And, and my, my comment is, um, is really hopefully to avoid something becoming a fatal flaw, um, which is this reference to um, forensic procedures and, and forensic um, involvement. Um, as, as Rich articulated, I think there's, um, you know, there are availability concerns. I think if it's something that we want to pursue, then we need to be very careful about how it's, you know, how it's defined, how it's explained, um, and consideration given to scalability and what the um, what the actions are if that kind of resource isn't uh, immediately available. Not just to a particular firm, but some some countries are are thin on that kind of capability. So um, I would urge the group to um, to work that through as they develop the proposals. Thanks. Thank you. Uh Karen. Thanks, thanks, Tom. And um, thanks to all the work that's gone into this in, in such a short period of time. Uh, I think most of you are aware how uh, important uh, fraud and going concern are to the PIOB. Uh, but I'm just going to throw out a couple of thoughts I had. These are my own. I haven't talked to the PIOB about them uh, at all. Um, the, the three ideas uh, I, I'm, I came to my mind while I was listening to you is, in your information gathering, would it be helpful to go in a, in a slightly uh, broader uh, approach, which is um, to talk to some of the experts who have been working on cyber? Um, the reason I mean this cyber is not because of um, you know how how it could relate to fraud, but just the experience that they've gained in terms of you know identifying it, why does it happen, you know, and and what parallels might bring uh, uh, to um, to your work. Uh, I I know this is more information gathering, and you'd rather go to solutions, but uh, the other one is. Um, is there any ability uh, to to talk to experts in crime? Because you know we all know what's happened in the past, but like everything else, it evolves and it always is looking for the weaknesses that 
we haven't maybe thought of and and uh, if um, some information gathering could be done on where where is the newest approach uh, uh, in terms of crime and then the third is of course behaviors a lot uh, a lot happens in terms of the behaviors of people um, and I just wondered if there was any possibility of, to do any research into uh, behavior analysis and how that could um, uh, uh, enrich your uh, information gathering. Thanks very much, Tom and Fiona. Thank you. Uh, Kai Ue. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Fiona, thanks for the presentation and uh, for the work uh, of the team, which has been done. Uh, I have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, first, uh, I agree. Uh, with the direction in the preliminary views, uh, but with respect to fraud risk factors, there may be a need to consider how uh, to better link the consideration of fraud risk factors to risk assessment at the financial statement and assertion levels. Uh, furthermore, consideration needs to be given uh, as to when forensic type procedures become necessary in certain areas. For example, when the auditor has reasonable grounds for believing uh, that the risk of a material misstatement due to the fraud is no longer uh, acceptable law. Then I have a further comment uh, here in this context, uh, missing in the discuss discussion of the expectation gaps is the difference between uh, what the public expects uh, auditors to do and what auditors are reasonably capable of doing. Uh, this gap can be called reasonableness gap. Uh, this difference is caused by the inherent limitation of audits that cannot be reduced or eliminated uh, except through education of the public. Therefore, uh, there's a fundamental flaw in the discussion about the expectation gap unless the issue is also given appropriate prominence in the discussion. Uh, I have a further comment uh, based on a recommendation of the Professional Skepticism Working Group. The IWSB had previously agreed that there are no levels of professional skepticism, only more or less intensive actions involved in exercising professional skepticism. Uh, so consequently, reference to increase professional skepticism is inappropriate, inappropriate and that uh, in extent ISA 240 requires revision. My last comment is, uh, and uh, this is based on our experience with the Wirecard case in Germany. Uh, I also believe that more needs to be done to clarify the responsibilities of management and those charged uh, with governance in relation uh, to the prevention and detection, uh, detection of fraud. Uh, more disclosures from management and those charged with governance as to how they manage fraud risk would be, in my view, appropriate. Uh, furthermore, auditors needs safe harbors for the communication and suspected fraud to public authorities when those charged with governance or senior manager are involved in potential material fraud. And this is the real case in, in Germany. Thanks. Thank you. Kai, uh, I don't see any other hands up. Fiona, I'll ask you for reactions to that. The other thing I suggest is we're really running out of time here and I, we do not have much flexibility on schedule. Is maybe we would take the remaining issues and ask anyone to raise any really big ticket items. Otherwise, to go back to the task force offline. We are at very early stages in this project. So there is lots of opportunity for board discussion on this point. Um, but uh, how does that sound as a suggestion? 
That sounds like an excellent suggestion. The only uh, comment I was going to make was to thank Sachiko for answering Sean Wee's question. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions coming your way on the, the Japanese standard in particular. Um, so thank you for that. I'll hand it back to you, Tom, for any other big ticket items people have with the remainder of the paper that they wanted to raise. Okay, we're not, we have about 10 minutes for this. So I'm not shutting off the opportunity for comment. I just needed to wrap this all up uh, okay, together. Uh, Josephine. Um, thank you. And um, I'm not sure if it's a big ticket or not, but um, I suppose in some ways it's um, a reaction to what Kaiu was saying in relation to greater transparency about management responsibilities. But um, there is clearly an ongoing concern that auditors aren't doing enough to detect risk material misstatement due to fraud. And this potentially could be due to a lack of clarity in the standard as to their obligations. So notwithstanding Kai's point, which I don't disagree with, auditors do still have a responsibility. And I think it's important we make that clear. So in the UK, for example, we were concerned that the messaging and the introduction of the standard is somewhat ambiguous and could be contributing to the lack of clarity. So it might be worth revisiting some of that language. I mean, in the UK, we literally made a couple of tweaks to just to bring about that clarity. So just a thought. And then and then again, to that point, you know, we do discuss greater transparency in the auditor report in your in your bullet points. And I, and I do think that's very important, not boilerplate. And um, and so uh, it is about that balance. And I don't think we should forget that auditors do still have a responsibility, Kai. I know that's not what you're saying, but I, I think it's important that we both recognize the wider ecosystem as well as auditors' obligations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, Rich? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, notwithstanding uh, what Josephine said, so I, 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 it's not like, I mean, how do you disagree with, with Josephine said, um, of course, auditors have a responsibility, uh, but I, I do think the right level setting needs to be um, brought into the standard like uh, Kaiowa has raised about, um, you know, who's the primary guardian against fraud? It, 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 it's not auditors. Um, it is management, those charged with government, uh, governance, sorry. Um, and so I, 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 we need to bring that in. We need to figure out how this also um, works or, or at least bring the ties together with no CLAR. Um, and, um, and I also, uh, you know, um, agree with the Kiowa's other point about the fraud risk factors. So I won't go into that. Um, and the last one is just a, a caution. I, we've heard really good stuff here today. Um, all good things that we should be thinking about and the, the working group should go uh, I would just put a caution in that uh, what we don't want, um, and I'll use my standard, not yours, Fiona, uh, a, another 540 that's, you know, 150 pages long and, and it's going to take all the people to get through. We, you know, we want to make sure that the changes we make are, are understandable, digestible, and that people can actually go about and, and apply them. If we, if we do a holistic change to 240 and, and change everything and put a lots of more, it's going to be harder to get that uh, consistency that we want as 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 a board and as 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 uh, the wider community. Uh, one of the things that's coming to my mind too is as the cusp task force is thinking about things uh, about sort of drafting conventions and other conventions in terms of improving the way our standards. It may very well feed into whatever work we we do on this and that. Uh, to Fiona's earlier point about 315 drafting, uh, you know, it may be an opportunity to he heighten. You know, what one of the things I've heard, I get the idea of roles and responsibilities of different ones. We, we should make sure that it doesn't seem like we're deflecting responsibility uh, on the auditor either. And we wouldn't want people to misconstrue the board's efforts in that regard. So I take what people say as truth, but the, at a time where the public interest demands greater attention to this, the, the, there could be a misperception that the that we could be trying to deflect, which I don't believe is the case at all. But I think in our messaging, we have to be quite clear. If the, the, anything, it's we're trying to clarify or heighten, which we haven't decided yet. Uh, but 
deflecting is definitely not on our, our, our radar screen. Uh, Bob? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom. And at, at the risk of cutting into the audit evidence time a little bit here, uh, I just wanted to add, um, you know, I think in our outreach and everything, it's, it's become pretty clear that, that technology and automated tools and techniques and things like that have a key role um, in enhancing effectiveness as we move forward, uh, whether it's characterized as forensic type work or whatever it may be. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the technology working group, actually the next item on our work stream plan um, is to address the use of automated tools and techniques with respect to ISA 240 and fraud. Uh, we have a meeting um, coming up uh, the week uh, next week where we'll be discussing that, but I can, I can tell you in working with Yvonne and Brett and Fernando on this, um, right now, well, there's a lot of, of uh, thoughts and material and guidance I think we can add. We're very cognizant that uh, doing that with non-authoritative guidance may not be the best approach at this point with the larger fraud project going on. Uh, it needs anything that we would do with technology needs to be in the context of all the other changes and ideas that we're talking about here uh, today with fraud. So I just wanted to make the board aware that the technology working group is on, on this track and discussing these items. And uh, I'm sure that will all be in good hands with Fernando as he takes over as chair and Yvonne and Brett uh, going forward. And we can feed that into uh, this project. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to comment on uh, the final, I guess it's four through nine uh, of the issues paper before I ask Fiona to, to wrap this up. Uh, okay, uh, Jim, K Karen, any further perspectives you'd like to provide? A CAG or PIOB perspective? Yes. Nope, nothing uh, further from me. Thanks, Tom. I just uh, wanted to reiterate uh, the, the CAG felt this was an important um, issue to explore, and uh, it was very supportive of um, your, the uh, IAASB's efforts on this. Thank you. Uh, this definitely remains a top priority for us. Sorry to truncate the discussion a little bit. Lots of time remaining in terms of you know, our current schedule is, uh, I believe, really a, a project proposal tentatively, if that's the way we go in September of, of next year. Uh, so opportunities to input. But for that reason, it's really important for if you didn't get anything on the record that you'd like to with a working group to send in your comments as soon as possible, because they are busy working away. We're going to get comments on our discussion paper, which we moved the deadline back to February 1st, as I believe, uh, to provide more time over the holiday period uh, for people to respond. Um, so I, I recommend uh, also encouraging everyone you, you know from different communities, including the communities that Karen uh, raised uh, to participate in some form um, and we'll consider outreach uh, to the extent that we haven't yet to other communities that have a stake in this discussion. Uh, Fiona, I turn it back to you to, to close. Thank you. Um, I'll just close briefly with thanking you all for your comments. I look forward to receiving offline comments as well, given the passion and discussion that was going on with just a couple of uh, teaser topics to start with. I'm sure there's a lot to come our way really helpful so thank you um, the great thing now is I do pass the baton of all the really hard work to my friend and colleague Lynn and I will just say Lynn you're off mute so before you swear maybe put yourself back on mute <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you did to deserve all the hard projects but I am confident you're up for the task and I will watch with interest to see how you progress and put more pebbles into the water jug on this topic um, and of course it wouldn't be a presentation for me without a closing joke uh, can't guarantee it's a good one and very hard to gauge reactions given we're on Zoom. But a magician worked on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. The audience would be different each week, so the magician did the same tricks each week. 
However, there was a problem. The captain's parrot saw the shows each week and began to understand how the magician did every trick. Once he understood, he started shouting out the secrets in the middle of the show. Look, it's not the same hat. Look, he's hiding the flowers under the table. Hey, why are all the cards the ace of spades? The magician was furious, but he couldn't do anything. It was, after all, the captain's parrot. One day, the ship had an accident and it sunk. The magician found himself with the parrot adrift on a piece of wood in the middle of the ocean. They stared at each other with hatred, didn't utter a word. This went on for a whole day and then another and then another. And finally, the parrot said, okay, I give up. Where the heck is the boat? <laughs> Time for a break, I think, Tom. Uh, I think so. Uh, <laughs> Roger, I like the reaction Roger put on the screen. Um, I didn't even know that was a potential reaction, Roger, uh, with Zoom. You learn something new each day. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. Uh, 10 minute break. It's 721 my time. So uh, 731 my time. Uh, we'll return. Uh, thank you, Fiona and team uh, for making so much progress. Thank you for everyone, for the comments. And when we return back, Bob, you're up. Issues for all, issues paper for audit evidence. Speak to you shortly.
if we could start coming back. One more sec. Okay, uh, let's get going. Uh, this time's limited. We're going to go till nine fifteen. Uh, my time. Uh, so, Bob, I'm going to hand it over to you to get going on the issues paper folded evidence. All right, well, thank you, Tom, and uh, welcome everyone. I guess um, just start off by saying uh, we had the discussion on, on Monday around the, uh, the, the project proposal, and at that time, and just to refresh everyone, um, we, we worked through that, and you should have received the revised draft uh, last night, at least US time here, um, and we'll go through that again and again tomorrow month. Friday morning, not a lot of substantial changes. So I uh, hope you'll be pleased with that. Um, today, we're gonna to turn our attention to our first discussion of audit evidence issues. Uh, that's been captured in the issues paper in agenda item three. Um, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm going to take that all of the material has been read. I think the, uh, uh, the working group really did a good job of laying out fundamentally what issues we were addressing. Uh, gave provided the background behind the issue, including relevant or significant pieces of information that was received from our stakeholders and in our information gathering and outreach activities, uh, and then put forth uh, working group views on how we would look at moving forward on some of these issues. Um, so the working group did a great job. Again, that's Eric and Jamie, Susan, uh, uh, Kai Uwe, and Sue, uh, and then Phil and Jasper, of course. The, I, I think the, uh, uh, just in, in introductory comments, uh, one question probably to knock off is how did we determine uh, the issues that we wanted to address with you today? And, and really, uh, believe me, there are many, many things that if we had uh, uh, hours of more time, we'd like to discuss uh, today, but we, we did try to uh, bring some discipline to the process. So essentially, um, in identifying the four issues that we'll talk about today, we really looked at those that the working group agreed were really fundamental to progressing the direction or the direction of the project. So that the, the issues I think that, that we'll talk about today are really cornerstone type things um, that will you know, where we need a direction to actually move forward further in some of our uh, other discussions of, of other issues. Um, also, they include um, areas where uh, maybe a lack of consensus is overstating it. I, obviously, we would not have put forth uh, or working group views uh, and things like that if we didn't at least have uh, general agreement on directions and views. But there are some areas here where even within the, the working group, uh, there may have been some different views or some different takes on different aspects of, of some of these issues. So uh, we've tried to lay those out so that we can get direction from that perspective. Um, and then um, I think as you'll, you'll probably pick up as we work through these after we discuss these issues today, they kind of cascade down into a series of other issues that are going to require uh, more deliberation. So that's kind of the criteria that we've used. We'll talk today uh, using agenda item three. Uh, the four key topics are the purpose and scope of ISA 500. We talked a little bit about that in the project plan on Monday. Uh, we're certainly going to talk about the, uh, as a matter of fact, most of the time probably on the concept and evaluation of sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Um, uh, the distinction, if any, uh, between sources of information um, as it relates to ISA 500. 
Uh, and then lastly, using information for different types or categories of audit procedures uh, we'll close off with today. So um, with that, I'm, uh, you know, the other aspect I think we need to set up before we move into the discussion, because you'll hear these terms used uh, quite commonly. So we, the working group has been working uh, on the basis after we agreed there really were three categories of um, sources of information. So uh, these, these are not defined in the standards today, but they are working definitions or guidance that the working group uh, developed to guide our discussions. And, and so I want the board to uh, understand what those are today as we pick up some of the, the uh, issues related to sources. First of all, uh, the three categories, internal information sources. That, um, just to be clear, we're talking about here, uh, that's information that the auditor obtained from uh, management, uh, essentially. That includes uh, both what's referred to in extant ISA 500 as information produced by the entity or, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the financial reporting process used to prepare the financial statements. We have also included uh, information that was not prepared by management, but was used by management to prepare the financial statement. So, for example, uh, management may have obtained themselves information from outside of the entity, but that information was used by management in, in preparing the financial statements. It would also include things like uh, use of management's experts. Information sources external to the entity is the second one. Um, I think that's that's pretty clear. It's really uh, anything other than in, internal information or or auditor generated information. Um, I think you know it includes things certainly uh, obtained from external sources or other parties. For example, uh, may get information from rating agencies. Um, clients, uh, external confirmation requests for accounts receivable, debtors, uh, bank confirmation, so on and so forth. Um, I think that the important thing to remember here is the working group in our discussions and in the context of this paper, that the scope of information sources external to the entity is not the same uh, or limited to the scope of external information sources or EIS. Uh, that was introduced and defined in ISA 500 due to the revisions of the ISA 540 project. So it's a broader, broader concept when we talk about external information sources. And then the third source of information is auditor generated. Uh, this reflects the, the fact that the auditor uh, actually develops information to be used as audit evidence. If you think about, for example, uh, using information in a data analytic uh, procedure, automated tool, or technique, or something uh, with that uh, type of, of aspect, uh, or auditors, experts for that matter. Um, there is information that the auditor actually develops to be used as audit evidence. I should also add um, if you think I'm not looking at you and looking away, it's simply because I've got, <laughs> I've got the Zoom thing on my second monitor. I, I am paying attention to you um, during this presentation. So with that, I think we can um, uh, move to our first issue. Um, you know, if we want to advance, there we go. Um, thank you. So as I described, we've, we've really laid out here in the issues paper using a structure. There's a background section um, and then the, the uh, working group views. I think, um, you know, one aspect to, to point out here uh, also, uh, just to be clear is, some of you may be wondering why, even though um, professional skepticism and technology uh, were two of the three big topics that we talked about in the project proposal, you don't see any uh, issues today that are specifically addressed to professional skepticism uh, or technology. And that's, that's not because we've changed our mind or we've done anything different uh, with this, but uh, rather that the, the working group has considered both work, uh, professional skepticism and technology pervasively across all of these issues. And you'll see that reference once in a while. So just to uh, clear the air there a little bit, if you have any questions about that. 
But I think at this point, then let's let's move to the first um, issue that we'd like to talk about, and that is the purpose and scope of ISA 500. Um, as as we we know, our agenda time is very very precious, so I'm not going to uh, read uh, the issues paper back to you. I want to spend most time getting your the board's input and feedback on these, but I will touch on a, a couple of, of uh, significant aspects here. I, I think first of all, um, when you look at the body of the eyes, as we discussed briefly on Monday, um, there. The, the concept of sufficient appropriate audit evidence is pretty pervasive, uh, clearly throughout the body uh, of the standards. Um, and this, I think when you look at and what the working group uh, is moving to is when you step back and look at the objectives and the purpose, specifically of ISA 500, uh, there can be uh, a little bit of a lack of clarity, uh, perhaps around um, some of this, um, it's, it's uh, in different contexts and perhaps the standard could better articulate how ISA 500 fits in uh, to the body of, of our standards and would be um, used in performing audit engagement. So um, just in the way of background very quickly, uh, ISA 200, for example, requires the auditor to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to reduce risk, audit risk to an acceptably low level. Um, ISA 500 then goes on and requires, or the objective is to design and perform audit procedures to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. And then if we look at ISA 330, um, ISA 330's objective is to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence regarding the assessed risk of material misstatement. So just looking at those three standards, you can see each one of them deal with a requirement to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Um, and so there are questions that were raised in our outreach and information gathering by our stakeholders uh, about really what is the purpose of ISA 500 and better clarity or more clarity would be very helpful. At this point, I should uh, point to um, another uh, agenda item uh, that you will have received and that was the supplement to agenda item three. Um, that was the, uh, uh, the narrated or automated, I guess, PowerPoint presentation uh, that was prepared by Susan Jones, one of our audit working group uh, members. Actually, that was captured uh, largely in the March 2019 uh, board meeting that we had in Toronto. Uh, mm -hmm. But we thought it was good background information. We're not going to play that or go through it in detail. But hopefully you had an opportunity to listen to Susan explain how all of the standards work together vis-a-vis uh, -vis ISA 500 um, in that regard. So essentially where the working group has, has arrived here is that uh, we believe or are working in the, the mode of uh, direction that the uh, ISA 500 really underpins all of the other ISAs. And perhaps the, the purpose and objective of, five, of ISA 500 uh, should not be necessarily on designing and performing procedures um, as one, one might believe today. Uh, we believe that's largely addressed in particular in ISA 3, 315 or ISA 330, depending on the type of procedure being used. Uh, but rather that ISA 500 should be a standard that um, directs and, uh, and requires and provides guidance to auditors uh, to support or inform the auditor's overall conclusions that are required elsewhere, whether it be ISA 200 or ISA 330, uh, which in, in the case of ISA 330 is where the overall conclusion about whether sufficient appropriate audit evidence has been obtained to support the auditor's report is actually located. Uh, so in other words, really what we're looking at here is to shift the focus of the objective of ISA 500 from designing and performing audit procedures to an objective that requires the auditor to make judgments 
about the sufficiency and appropriateness of the information to be used as audit evidence. Um, and that clarifying through guidance then that the auditor's judgments about that information to be used as audit evidence uh, is in accordance with uh, the, the, um, the considerations that we would include in ISA 500. So in other words, uh, I think to put it simply, uh, we would, the, the working group's view is that ISA 500 would be a standard that auditors use in conjunction with all the other standards, anytime there's a reference to sufficient appropriate audit evidence, the auditor would go to ISA 500 to look at what needs to be done in order for them to draw those judgments, the, the, the considerations and the actions to be taken. So that's, that's uh, where we're at here. We, we uh, have a view that we'd like to go in the direction of providing, of course, some additional uh, material to explain the relationship better uh, between a revised ISA 500 and uh, the other standards, particularly uh, 200, 315, and, and uh, 330 um, in that regard, and then change the uh, or revise the objective of ISA 500 uh, to move away from designing procedures to obtain audit evidence to requiring that the auditor make judgments and how to do that about the sufficiency and appropriateness of audit evidence. So at that time, I, I turned to um, our first question, actually it's question two in the slide deck. Uh, we'd like uh, you know, to get the, the board's views on, on the observations that we uh, put forth in the issues paper on the overlap of objectives between uh, different ISAs and then the, uh, the proposed direction uh, that we've articulated in the issues paper uh, as to how to deal with, with that overlap and concerns that were raised by our stakeholders and outreach. So I'll hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about the objectives of 500 to 330, the overlap and the direction that the task force is proposing in relation to that. Uh, any first takers? I know Fiona's waiting to press it. So come on, Fiona. All you. Thank you. And thank you, Bob, for the introductory comments. And I think I said the other day when um, we talked about audit evidence as well, that I really enjoyed the paper and I found it um, you know, really interesting sort of from an intellectual perspective, thinking about some of these challenges that you've been working through as a, as a working group. On this particular question, I'm uh, a supporter of your initial views and, and direction that you're proposing, particularly um, around enhancing guidance around professional skepticism. I think that's very sensible. Um, one minor point where you talk about the linkages with other standards, um, ISA 220 introduced um, application material on types of bias. So I just wonder as, you um, explored the linkages to other standards. If you would add that one to the list, I think that would be helpful. And no other comments on this, but I, I'm sure we will get a chance to talk about the three types of evidence and some of the other things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josephine? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Bob, uh, to you and, and all the task force again for the hard work. I did actually also enjoy reading this paper. Uh, always quite good to get into that technical stuff now and again. Um, I have a slightly different view, uh, sorry, possibly from most of the board members on this. Um, but first of all, as I mentioned in the, uh, the discussion we had on the project proposal, I don't think that there's actually sufficient emphasis on the relationship between 315 and ISA 500. And, um, and to that extent, that actually makes me think that I'm not sure that it's right to actually move away from the objective in ISA 500 at all. I think actually, to your point, it is foundational. There are audit procedures in every other standard, but that doesn't mean we don't need that foundational aspect, which is to perform audit procedures. And then of course, to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence and, and extend and clarify in that area. Um, I mean, really, this is to question five, but as a follow on, although we didn't actually clarify this when we were closing ISA 315, it is important that this source of detection risk, so the risk of failing to identify a risk statement, 
at the association level is taken into account along with other sources of detection risk and determining overall whether the audit evidence obtained about the existence of the material misstatement at the assertion level is sufficient and appropriate, and of course at the overall financial statement level. And I, I think because of that, those, those linkages need to be made stronger. And then the, the purpose of 500 and the reason why we cover the audit procedures piece in 500 might be clearer. So, uh, so unfortunately, I'm not in agreement at this stage um, to shift the focus away from designing and performing audit procedures from ISA 500. Um, I also absolutely agree with Fiona. I think we are forgetting ISA 220. You do obtain audit evidence um, from ISA 220. You pick that up a little bit later in the paper. So, you know, if any of those steps fail, for example, the review wasn't sufficient for the resource that was determined, then you don't, you won't have the right audit evidence. So I think that linkage is also um, very important. So, those are my initial views on question two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sachka. Oh, thank you, Tom. And thank you very much for your um, explanation. Uh, with regard to um, A, I'm okay with the working group's proposal to shifting the focus of the objective. But maybe I think this also relates to the discussion we had on Monday around conforming um, amendment to project in project proposal. Um, the issue plan to be addressed by this project actually includes those relating to designing and performing audit procedures, such as um, categorization of procedures and questions relating to uh, new technologies that allow the auditor to analyze larger population. So I would like to confirm that these issues will be addressed in the project regardless of the conclusion by the board on shifting the focus of the objective of 500. I think they should be addressed anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you and thank you, uh, Bob, for the introduction. Um, I as well spent some time with this paper because I'll agree I hadn't thought about some of these concepts, um, you know, sat back and thought about them because I, I think maybe just inherently or fundamentally, I, I'm, I, I don't think necessarily of the exact words in the objectives. I think more about what we're trying to achieve with the objectives. And so I spent some time thinking about that. I would say I'm, I'm a, a little bit cautious at this point about um, moving away from the objectives in 500. And, and the reason for that, Bob, is I'm not, 100% convinced yet that by shifting the objective in 500, we haven't missed something or something hasn't fallen through the cracks. And the reason why I say that is because when I look at the objectives in 330 and 315 and some of the other ones that you mentioned in the um, introduction, it doesn't, in my mind, capture all of the audit procedures that we do in an audit and all of the evidence that we obtain in an audit. So 330 talks about the procedures and the evidence sorry, the procedures you do to address ROM, assess ROMs, uh, risk of material misstatement, but we do a lot of other audit procedures where we gather evidence. And I just wonder if we're missing something um, by stripping out that, that piece of 500 that sits in the objective today. And so <clears throat> I'm not opposed to considering it. I just think we just need to be a little bit cautious about moving too fast there without considering, you know, all of the information that we we gather and that we have to design procedures across the entire audit for that purpose. Um, I was I was comfortable with the direction of the task force on your second bullet there around the linkages. I think that's important to draw that out. And so I had no issue with um, the proposals that you put forward from the task force on that point. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Isabel. Yes, thank you very much for the paper and the explanations. Um, I was surprised by these questions because um, I have never read the ISAs in isolation, but more uh, as a package. So uh, I must admit that I had never noticed uh, that there was an overlap uh, between uh, ISA 500 and ISA 330. And and, if there, and there may be an overlap, but at least um, it has never been considered as an issue. 
and I've never been aware that it has created any issue in practice and in the quality of the audit. Um, however, um, I understood what was in the paper and um, if, um, if you believe uh, it needs to be done, uh, we can do it. But for me, uh, like some others that have already spoken, um, it was not the priority of the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Isabel. Uh, so we're going to go to Fernando and then Rich. I, I just have to step out for a second to help my kids with something. Um, I'll be right back. But uh, Fernando and then Rich to follow. And if I'm still away for a second, my uh, Fiona, Fiona will help. Thanks, Tom. And Bob, thanks a lot for the explanation and for the task force for the papers. Um, I have to admit I spent some time reading this specific section and, and I think your comments were very helpful to um, help me understand a little bit more details. Um, I have to presume that today um, auditors are really in compliance with the objectives of 500 and 330 because we are issuing the opinions and, and I'm assuming we have the design of the procedures and the sufficient and appropriate evidence to support um, whatever has been issued. So even though there's some kind of overlap, um, I would presume somehow we're in compliance with both the standards and probably as Isabel mentioned, um, you, you read them as a whole package and not in isolation. I'm not really against clarifying the objective of 500, if that really helps auditors to have a better understanding and improves the execution in terms of the um, assessment of the evaluation of the sufficiency and appropriate audit evidence. And on the other hand, on 330, just thinking about the design of the procedures. Um, but I'm not really sure if, if, if we are really having a significant or major issue in practice with this overlap in the objectives. Um, I'm fine and I also support uh, the um, letter B in terms of the linkages with the other standards. Um, but on the first one, uh, even though I do not object, I'm not really sure if this is like a critical um, topic to resolve, thanks. Bob, you want me to just go? Go ahead, Rick. Um, so, um, you know, I look at uh, 500 as a conceptual uh, standard, um, one that really sets the framework, the basis to, uh, for which auditors then will evaluate the sufficiency of openness of audit evidence. So to that, to that degree, I'm, I'm happy with where the working group is, is going. Um, I, I do take note of Julie's comment of you know, making sure we stand back and make sure we're not losing something by taking out this uh, um, uh, potentially overlapping uh, objective. But I, I, I think that's what you're be looking at, making sure you do. So I'm, I'm happy where the uh, working group's going. And uh, I'm also okay with uh, how you address the, so the uh, linkages. Thanks. Okay, uh, not, it doesn't look like Tom's back. Um, Fiona, do you want to pick up? Or do you just I wasn't around? fast enough with the unmute, I, I apologize. All right. <laughs> Roger was next on the list. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. Again, thanks, thanks Bob, for the uh, paper. I, too, view 500 as a conceptual standard, and that's the way I've, I've thought about it. Uh, so I'm comfortable with what the task force is trying to do in this particular area. The concerns are uh, similar to Julie and Rich uh, that we don't lose anything. And as we get into the different sources of evidence, we might have a little bit of that discussion. Um, uh, happy with the reference to 220 and the building up of the reference there. The other one for me, Bob, and I know it's not one for everybody, is... Uh, what does it mean for the framework, uh, the conceptual framework, framework for assurance services? Because we've got a lot of conceptual stuff in there on audit evidence, and I know not everybody adopts it, um, but a lot of all, uh, a lot of jurisdictions do. Uh, so, uh, so, and again, I usually go back to that for the concepts of audit evidence, which has got about thirty something paragraphs in it. So, 
if you could explain that to me, because we probably haven't paid a lot of attention to it in some of the recent standards. So, um, so it's uh, it's suffering a little bit. Uh, but uh, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm supportive, but uh, trying to work out how it fits into the overall suite. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Yosh. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for very interesting paper. I, I like this readable paper. Uh, we agree with the working group view that the objectives of ISA 330 and ISA 500 overlap. As stated in the ISA 200, paragraph A69, the purpose is what the auditor is expected to do. So the specific purpose for the ISA 500 should be considered. If so, it would be better to clearly provide that the purpose of ISA 500 is not to design and perform appropriate audit procedure to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, but to evaluate the, and document information for using as uh, sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, I think. It should be noticed to ensure that the purpose of ISA 500 does not become an overarching objective because uh, for example, the LC audit standard provide that the audit evidence is included in its introductory part. If the purpose of the ISA 500 is abstracted, I am worrying that the working group, should, working group should consider to move the ISA 500 into the general principles like the ISA 200 section. About two second breath, the working group is considering subtitling the introduction action key concept of this ISA, like the ISA 540, in order to explain the relationship between other ISAs and the 500. But I would like this to address in the CASP project because it would affect the style of the description of other ISAs in general, not only the ISA 500. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Come, come on. Hey, thank you. And thank you, Bob and the working group for the the presentation and the papers delivered. Um, I support uh, the working group's position on both A and B, uh, even though I'm not sure that the the overlap is creating uh, um, that much confusion and that should be the main focus for this uh, project, but uh, it is not your main focus, but uh, just making sure that we don't spend too much time on that. So, okay, thanks. So uh, having listened to this round, I feel like there's a sort of a diversity or to draw on our yesterday's uh, discussion, a spectrum of views on this from sort of support to cautious, tread carefully here to potential concern about unintended consequences with moving ahead with this direction. Uh, so I don't feel that that's necessarily blocking the exploration of this approach, but certainly at, at best it's proceed with caution. Yeah, th thanks Tom. And, and thanks everyone for the feedback on that. I, I think, uh, you know, certainly picking up on, on some of the, uh, uh, the specifics, uh, Josephine, yeah, the, the focus on 315, I think, uh, is something to 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 really look at, and uh, Julie, I take uh, take your words, uh, your advice very uh, very well. In that, uh, we we do need to probably look deeper to make sure that we aren't we would not be missing some audit procedures if if the objective of, of five hundred were to change. So we can certainly do that. And and Roger, quite quite frankly. Um, you know, I, I think the intention would be that, uh, you know, whatever we do in this project would, uh, would be relevant to and reflected in the conceptual framework. But I think you, you even uh, um, articulated that we haven't really looked heavily at the conceptual framework uh, in recent projects. Uh, so that's something I think that the working group, uh, hopefully task force following tomorrow, uh, will go back and have a look at. Um, going forward. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. The other um, uh, observation I jotted down was uh, don't make this a primary 
uh, reason for this project uh, because people aren't sure it's really causing a practice problem. And I, I, I think the working group would agree that um, we, we chronologically put this first in the discussion today just because uh, every ISA starts off with an objective and a purpose. Uh, but I don't think from a significance or impact perspective, it was number one on our list. Uh, and it's probably one of those that as you move through the project, the uh, needed or necessary changes to an objective become more clear uh, or perhaps lack, lack of need for a change in an objective. So I think that's something to keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, but let's, let's move to the next issue then. If we could go to the next slide. Um, and that has to do with the, the concept and evaluation of sufficient appropriate audit evidence. I, um, as I just articulated with, with the purpose and the objective, um, although we heard a lot of support about better articulating and clearly um, uh, you know, talking about the linkages between the standards, um, this particular um, issue is probably the one um, that the, the working group has spent the most time on. I think it's, um, it's the issue um, as articulated in the, in the issues paper where stakeholders in our information gathering and outreach process had the most questions we, we've heard the most about. Um, and it really arises from um, a perspective, I think, of a, a combination of different aspects coming together um, in today's world. Uh, and that's with, with the, the increase in the number of sources of, of information, particularly external sources, the use of technology, the digitalization uh, of audit evidence and the way business is conducted, um, it's just caused stakeholders to pause and reconsider or ask about what does sufficient and appropriate really mean um, in today's world. Uh, when you move out of, uh, again, when the standard was really drafted um, in a paper-based world where it's mostly internal information, should we be looking at this? Um, you'll see in the, in the uh, issues paper, we, we talk about uh, the concept of uh, bringing to life, I think, maybe is a way of describing it in ISA 500, the concept of persuasiveness. Um, persuasiveness is currently a, a concept that's used in ISA 330 uh, when we talk about the overall conclusion about sufficiency and appropriateness and whether the, um, the assessed risks of material misstatements have been appropriately responded to. Uh, but we did get in our outreach um, from our stakeholders uh, feedback that perhaps persuasiveness was a concept that would be useful in helping us to articulate uh, better what we what might be meant by sufficient and appropriate in today's world. And I, I'd say when we when we met with the CAG uh, in September, uh, the the CAG also expressed support. Uh, for exploring this concept of persuasiveness uh, further. So we, we do support the introduction of that concept into 500. Um, it, it's, a, it's a concept I think uh, probably best described as bringing sufficient and appropriate together and looking at uh, in today's world uh, is, is one piece of very, very strong evidence persuasive. Uh, enough to be determined, be determined as, as sufficient uh, is one way to look at it. So um, it, that's something the working group would like to explore further, uh, but taking an initial view that we would incorporate that concept in 500, expanding on what's already in, in 330. We've also, um, as a working group, of course, um, looked at the definitions that are in extant 500 um, and their, uh, you know, whether considering whether uh, further expansion or definition of both uh, what's meant by sufficiency, what's meant by appropriateness, 
uh, what is, what's meant by relevance, what's meant by reliability, uh, and the definition of audit evidence itself uh, should be explored. And I think that the working group, you know, is of the mind that each one of those definitions deserve uh, further exploration. Um, and I think the, the place that you see that come through uh, most clearly is the working group has started um, the, the process by really diving into the, the concepts and guidance around the, the relevance and reliability of audit evidence. So um, when, you, when you look at that, um, it's clearly the place where we've done the most uh, work. We, we do believe as a working group that this is an area that needs to be very much principles-based um, for a couple of different reasons. One is the, the, the variety and the nature of the source of information being used today is just so, uh, so different that it's, it's hard to be prescriptive about exactly what the auditor should be thinking about and really uh, placing more weight on in each you know, specific circumstance and each piece of evidence that might be considered. So a principle-based approach better there. And secondly, you know, also from a durability or a longevity um, and relevance of the standard itself, uh, staying with a principle-based approach should allow for evolution in the way that business is conducted and use of technology and things like that also. Uh, so a principle-based approach is very, very much where we're going. I think the, the, uh, the most work or the, the thing that we've spent the most time as a working group uh, since September of last year has been around um, the consideration of relevance and reliability and and you'll see beginning in paragraph uh, 49 and continuing through, uh, uh, well, actually it is paragraph 49 in the issues paper, we have the tables uh, that we've been working on. So we've, we've tentatively at this point um, described the relevance of information as being the degree to which information is being used as audit evidence relates to fulfilling the purpose of an audit procedure. Um, these are things that uh, these are terms that are used in ISO 500 today, but not defined really, or described or fleshed out as to what it really means. So uh, we've been working uh, on this framework of considerations, and, and, and you can see we've essentially identified four attributes that we think, uh, you know, may be considered by the auditor when trying uh, to establish the relevance of information, those being understandability. Uh, the relationship of the information to the question at hand or the assertion being addressed, uh, the, uh, the impact or whether it's consistent or inconsistent, and, and then the precision. And, and you can see those descriptions in, um, in the issues paper. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time on thinking through what we mean by reliability of information. Um, you will recognize some of the attributes that we've picked up here uh, as being those that were put forth in the AICPA's audit evidence project, but we have some additional uh, concepts here too. So authenticity, accuracy, bias, uh, completeness uh, were certainly uh, in the AICPA project and the working group feels comfortable with those. You can see the brief description, uh, descriptions that we've provided. But we've also added uh, authorization. In other words, when you're thinking about the source and the information that you're looking at, um, is it appropriately authorized? Or in other words, if, is the individual or organization providing the information authorized uh, to provide that information? It is not getting at whether the auditor is authorized uh, to access the information. Uh, we've determined that that type of of question is probably outside the scope of the 500 project at this point. Uh, and then also spending some time around the concept of credibility, uh, which I think um, in our outreach and, and uh, uh, research gathering um, came through as loud and clear. That's kind of the common theme was uh, when an auditor is looking at a piece of information, um, how credible is that information? 
uh, in being used. And you can see we, we've got some subcategories or factors that we believe impact the credibility of information, uh, particularly the source of information, uh, being trustworthiness um, and, uh, and competence. So those deal with um, the, the concepts, the definitions, and where the working group is headed in that direction. Um, and then uh, to kind of round out this particular issue, the working group has also been dealing with the uh, proposed or thoughts around the work effort um, associated with, with each of these. Um, the, the, uh, you know, we, we currently have in ISA 500 um, the concept that the, um, the specifically with respect to information produced by the entity that the auditor needs to evaluate whether that information um, is sufficiently reliable for their purposes. Um, it uh, uh, goes into, in that fact, you, you need to consider whether it's sufficiently accurate, uh, detailed, precise, uh, so on and so forth. Um, as you know, I think as, as we've, we've put out in the paper, um, the working group does not find that uh, specific distinction or those requirements specifically related only to information produced by the entity uh, to be particularly useful, um, especially with the, the increase in the number of sources available uh, today. Uh, so the working group is proposing to make these requirements and this guidance applicable to information obtained by the auditor, uh, notwithstanding the source uh, from which it's obtained, but retaining this concept of a need for the auditor to evaluate whether that information is relevant and reliable by considering the factors relating to or attributes of um, the relevance and reliability of information to be used. So um, still requiring an evaluation. Uh, we looked at uh, the IAASB's glossary of terms. Uh, we considered different terms that have already been defined and determined that evaluation uh, was the most appropriate for information obtained from internal sources and external sources. Uh, but because of the relationship with ISA 220 uh, and that uh, uh, those those uh, characteristics we determined or we're going down the path that for auditor generated information, uh, the uh, consider shall consider would be more appropriate rather than shall evaluate in that context because of the work that the auditor already would have done uh, in accordance with 220 with respect to the reliability of the information. So Tom, uh, with that, I think that's the, the highlights anyway in that section of the issues paper. Uh, and turn it back to you to uh, address questions, uh, question three, uh, A, B, C, and D uh, for the board. Okay, any comments on question A through D? And really what you're asking is permission to explore the persuasiveness concept, not a clear agreement on the board on adopting that going forward. Yeah, yeah, Tom, I, and perhaps I should have been more clear at the outset in the introduction. What you're, what you're hearing today are, are truly working group views on a way forward. There, uh, there are no uh, specific proposals that we're asking for agreement on or anything like that. We're, we're really using today to get the input from the board to give us the direction that we can continue to explore some of these topics. Okay, great. Julie. Thanks, Bob. Um, a, a few thoughts on this question. Um, it's really the, the meaty question, I would say, in your paper. Um, I don't have any issues with the working group proceeding and you know, considering the concept of persuasiveness. Personally, I think that defining it's going to be quite difficult. I think there's a lot of judgment involved in that term. And, and I think trying to come up with something that's a definition or maybe some sort of formula will be quite difficult, but no issues with the working group sort of tr trying to proceed and, and thinking about introducing the concept. 
On your set of factors, I guess, um, based on my outreach, there were two schools of thought on those. One was, um, will that become a checklist? And will, will the um, list of factors be ticked off by every auditor every time? And maybe that's not the appropriate response because not every factor is going to be applicable every time you're thinking about relevance and reliability. The other school of thought was, will this limit people to only thinking about those factors when they're considering relevance and reliability? So interesting, we had two different views there, but um, I didn't really have any issue with your factors, just some caution that they don't become de facto checklists. On your factors though, one of them, um, we wondered if was missing was in the um, relevance section was importance, because I think importance to the objective of the auditor or the test in which the auditor's performing procedure is important, well, Im important. <laughs> so we wondered if importance might be worth considering in, in that section. And then on, the, on C, when you get to the work effort, I think when you mean work effort, you're talking about the phrase evaluate. Um, and I think that's fine, but I think that um, there'll be a spectrum as to what that means based on what type of evidence it is. Because I think internal, external, and maybe something the auditor gen generates will, will be on some sort of spectrum as to what the evaluation looks like. So there'll be potentially a difference in the nature and extent of procedures performed to get to that evaluation, it won't just be the same work effort regardless of the source of information. So if, if I've understood that correctly, I'm fine with that, but I think that there is a spectrum there. Um, it won't just be the same because I think this paper points out that external information is gonna be much harder to get at some of those factors than internal information. And I wouldn't want the outcome of this to be that auditors steer away from external information because they think that they have to do all these procedures that are almost impossible to do. I think we want to still have that balance of all sources of information in the audit. And then lastly, um, supportive of point D, I think um, tread carefully, maybe on authenticity, that, that's going to be a tricky one. <laughs> Definitely we need to consider it, but um, you know, if, if we go too far there, I think that will be a struggle um, for auditors, but um, certainly happy to see that you've built in some concept of skepticism in, in your proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Thanks, Tom. I agree with a lot of what Julie has just said. The additional comments I would make on the, the relevance piece, uh, impact wasn't intuitive to me. I wonder why we don't just call it consistency because now I understand what you actually mean. Um, bias, I think where you talk about um, the degree to which the information is free from bias, including fraud, I think what you mean is intentional bias there. Um, so maybe we just make that clearer. And the credibility one, this here seems to overlap with a lot of the other, like with other factors. And I just wonder how we clarify how all those factors work together. Um, in terms of the proposed work effort, work effort um, I have a concern around, um, you've changed it to evaluate whether the information is relevant and reliable, and that makes the evaluation very black and white, and I'm not sure that is the case. So you, my interpretation is you're getting the auditor to decide if it's relevant or not, and if it's reliable or not. So it's a very, you only, it's a yes or no, you, you are or you aren't, can't be a little bit pregnant. Um, so that one troubled me. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the concept of auditor generated information troubled me as well. Um, I can't see how auditor generated information isn't already grounded in information either provided by the entity or information that is external. So an external source of information. So I just wondered, why do we actually need that third category? I, I wasn't sure that that was particularly helpful. Um, and, and yeah, the, this, the ability to lose that spectrum of reliability, I think is a really key point as well. Um, they're my additional comments. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Sachika? Thank you. Um, with regard to A, I'm, I'm okay to pursue, but at this time, it's not clear to me what will be uh, changed by introducing the concept of persuasiveness, because 
it seems there is overlap between possessiveness and the concept of sufficiency and appropriateness. So I do not clearly understand or the benefit of the introduction of new concept. And uh, with regard to B, developing factual attributes, um, I agree to with the proposal to develop, uh, but unless the introduction of the factor does not increase unnecessary burden in practice, because I have some uh, concern on the preliminary listing. Uh, maybe it's very uh, sort of similar view with uh, Julia and Fiona said, I think it's too detailed. In addition, some factors are duplicated with others, for example, uh, credibility bias and authorization. And also without clear explanation, um, it's not clear how to use this list. For example, it may be interpreted that the auditor needs to consider all factors for information. I know that you know uh, you emphasize that the listing is not meant to be a checklist, but I think there is a risk that list will be used as a checklist due to the reason. So to avoid this, maybe it is necessary to streamline the list and include clear guidance as to how to use the list appropriately. For example, clarifying that it is not necessary that the auditor needs to consider all attributes in all in cases, or it is not necessary that the auditors need to use this list in all cases. And with regard to work effort, perhaps it may be more related to question four, um, but I am supportive of the proposal to develop principle-based approach. Um, but in reality, uh, there is a difference for the level of work that auditor can perform between on external information and on internal information. For example, it may be not be possible to directly evaluate reliability of external information. So I think careful consideration is necessary that when developing the guidance so that it will not be impracticable. That's all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Yosh. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the task first. Uh, about the persuasiveness, uh, Brett A. As for using the concept of persuasiveness, which is already used in the ISA 23030 and the 540 revised, we agree to use it as an overarching concept of evaluating audit evidence. However, Persuasiveness should be considered not only in terms of sufficiency, but also in terms of both sufficiency and appropriateness, because sufficiency is a quantity issue and appropriateness is quality issue for, for audit evidence. So, uh, and as there seems to be a spectrum as shown by Joy and Fiona, spectrum of persuasiveness, the concept of the degree of persuasiveness should also be considered by task force. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm more. Um, thank you. Uh, on the concept of pervasiveness, uh, as explained by letters, that, that somewhat com uh, is already there, but um, I think uh, defining pervasive audit evidence uh, will be difficult, as others explained. Uh, that there is a spectrum, um, and I'm not also sure how this actually will help uh, the practitioners or um, the evaluation. I do, however, like your list, uh, the tables that you referred to. I like them very much, uh, but I think as others, I would find there are some overlaps on some of them, so they can be worked on. Um, so I think that's uh, somewhat at the core of the issue that they're not evaluating and figuring out what are the actual points that they need to consider uh, evaluating the audit evidence is really good. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about checklists. So I think that's the response to auditors when they don't know exactly what to do. They just make sure that they've done uh, what they think is done, uh, is supposed to be done and check off on a list uh, that may be uh, helped out with how the requirements or the um, application materials is written, so it's not uh, um, not just to be make sure that you've evaluated all of this in the document, but uh, what we mean by the work effort in there. So um, supportive to move forward, uh, like your table, um, uh, but there's some caution on how to do this, not to make it a black and white decision. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Rich? Thanks, Tom, and thanks, Bob, for uh, setting this up. Um, so uh, I'm very much in the camp um, of Julie on how she explained pers persuasiveness uh, in, in how you're dealing with it. I, I'm happy for it to come in or be more um, uh, brought, you know, brought into the, the whole concept, but, but I, I don't think you're gonna be able to easily define it. And, and I think it'll be confusing if you try to, uh, but, but clearly it is very important to the concept of uh, audit evidence. So, so I'm happy with that. Um, I have to say, I, I had this uncomfortable, uncomfortable feeling uh, as, as uh, Fiona was speaking, um, because I was getting comfortable with what she was saying. <laughs> so, um, but very much down on, on the factors. Uh, impact, I had the exact same uh, thinking when, uh, when I read it as, as Fiona. Um, audit generated, again, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we need to be uh, opening up uh, big holes that uh, aren't really there. Um, and, um, you know, on Sajiko, on the documentation and whether it's all factors, um, you know, the checklist, all of that stuff comes into my mind. Uh, I'd really be concerned if we, if we, uh, had to document all factors, uh, I think that, you know, get us, uh, in a place that, uh, I don't think we want to be. Um, the last point was just, um, and I know you're going to talk about it in March, but on the, uh, definition of audit evidence, um, and, and whether we take something similar to what the U.S. Uh, uh, ASCPA came up with. And I just, we had some outreach that, that said, uh, um, not sure they like that way because of the um, idea of evidence is information to which audit procedures have been uh, applied to. And, and again, the confusion that might come around that and, and splitting the hairs as to what, whether that was the case. So thanks, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Chen Wei. Thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you, Bob, for the interesting paper. Um, I'll be quick. I, I agree with many of the comments that have already been made, so I won't repeat them necessarily. Um, but just going through um, the paper, I guess at this stage, I'm not opposing us exploring any of the things that we are setting out to, to explore. Um, I think those are good things to look into. Um, I just find myself, as I go through the paper, sometimes wondering if we are sort of over-engineering things a little bit and whether we are really addressing the key issues. Um, and and I, I know the task force will do it, but just to encourage us to go back um, very frequently to the inventory of issues that have been identified through a very thorough um, and robust process to make sure that you know, we, are, we are really keeping those in mind. Um, and, and I'll just call out one thing which has been raised by others already. I mean, the point, for example, on the auditor generated information, I agree with, um, you know, I think, especially Fiona. Um, it, I, I was looking at it and, and just thinking, you know, would it really change behavior? What would happen in practice? What do we expect to see in terms of documentation? You know, so, so is this another take against the box without really changing? anything in terms of the audit quality that we're pursuing. So, so again, you know, um, not against pursuing all these different areas, but just to be very conscious about you know, the real impact that it's going to have. Um, thanks, Paul. Thank you. Uh, Josephine? Thank you. Um, also, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, many uh, consistent views. Um, taking it uh, in peace, I, um, I agree with Julie on, and others on persuasiveness. Um, certainly think about describing it. Really don't think it's um, going to be capable of being defined, but um, by all means, explore further. Um, in terms of developing the set of factors, also like others, I'm not opposed to an approach that gives more information to practitioners in terms of breaking down relevance and reliability. Stakeholders have asked you to look at that. So, so you are being responsive, but... But clearly, as others have expressed, I am worried that the proposed requirement to consider those, well, not requirement, the comment that you consider those attributes or factors in relation to all sources of evidence 
could be such granular detail that would be overly burdensome. And that's not just for an LC, that's for any auditor. So I think that's more non-authoritative. I think that Sachio, Sachiko, sorry, Sachiko, had some good ideas about how you might address that, thinking about how they interact, when or when you might apply them, et cetera, and, and thinking about them from that perspective. But, but by all means, if stakeholders say they need something to support the relevance and reliability question, then, then do continue to explore it. Um, like Fiona, I'm also really struggling with your proposal to distinguish between auditor-generated information and information received from internal and external sources. I think to this point, what people might be looking for, and this might not be right, but is what are those audit procedures that auditors do that come through the other standards, like the quality management standards, for example, and how does the um, information from those procedures actually impact your conclusion on sufficient appropriate audit evidence at the end of the day? So I think that might be the piece that we could need, we could really explore rather than try and um, define them because when you started the presentation, you talked about it in the way that Fiona described it, that it came from essentially the inputs are still coming from management or, or external sources. But in the paper, you talk about 220 ideas. So I think it's more about how is that supporting your evidence decisions at the end of the day, rather than trying to split between the two sources. Um, like others, I agree on the considerations relating to professional skepticism. Um, whilst I um, certainly uh, agree with Julie's caution on authenticity, we have actually done a little bit of work on authenticity in our consultation on ISA 240. So uh, you might want to have a look at the application material we put in there just to get some ideas. I mean, something certainly to look at. Um, but yes, caution on what, what can be done from that perspective. And the only uh, final point I want to say is, is to Rich's point, I also um, heard concerns about um, the definition of order evidence. It might be that it's out of context in the issues paper, but um, this, it, this idea that it's only there to directly corroborate or contradict assertions in the financial statements, I'm not sure that that's necessarily uh, true in all cases. So, so maybe just um, caution in that area too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fernando? Bob, same as others, uh, in uh, favor of the proposed direction uh, for A to D, and just being careful on the concepts of factors and attributes and not over-engineering the process and the concept of auditor-generated information. I think it's over-complicating sources of information. But besides that, my support. Thanks. Okay, Isabel? Yes, Ar arriving at this point in the conversation, uh, many things have been done, uh, have, have been said, sorry. Uh, so I will refer to what has been said uh, so that you, you can understand what I think. Uh, on point A, I'm very much where uh, Sashiko is. Uh, what, what will per persuasiveness add? Uh, compared to what we currently had. I'm not sure we need it. Uh, on point B, I have the same feeling uh, as Julie. It was really um, my perception that uh, it will end sooner or later in a checklist. And if we have a checklist, uh, it's con counterproductive because um, we will lower uh, professional skepticism. And it's exactly the opposite of what we are trying to do. And on point C, exactly the same reaction as Fiona. Uh, I did not understand what we, why we needed this additional layer of uh, auditor-generated information, uh, because an auditor is never generating information out of the box from nothing. We always use an original data, whether internal to the audited entity or external to the audited entity, and then we perform a procedure on this data. So I don't understand why we need to add uh, this uh, additional uh, layer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lynn? Sorry, I'm very slow at getting my unmute off. Um, just a couple of points on A and B. I support exploring them, 
but I am skeptical about whether it's going to be possible to define um, persuasive, um, persuasive audit evidence. And certainly from my outreach, we got mixed views about whether they thought the introduction would make a difference. And I'd certainly be looking as we move forward and exploring that for what difference is it going to make to what we've currently got. Um, in terms of the factors, I, I do like the factors with the exception of the one on credibility I like the idea of credibility, but the description of it is more or less a repeat of everything else that's said. So I think that one probably needs um, some particular work. Um, and I don't have any comments on C and D. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Lynn. And Roger, final hand up. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, look, I think most things have been said. Um, Again, I think it reinforces the conceptual nature. Uh, if this uh, if this remains conceptual, uh, then certainly explore. Uh, so uh, and uh, so, I, I think certainly uh, looking at the concept of persuasive is good. Um, very worried about burdensome nature and checklists associated with B. Uh, the fact that these things could be taken down to a micro level of information items. Uh, and we've got to really look at information sets. Uh, and a whole lot of ways of bringing different types of information together to see how it's consistent. Um, and uh, so I am a little bit worried about the burden, worried uh, about it. So they're probably the additional, uh, additional comments. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Uh, I see some, some very consistent themes and actually it's sort of similar, not dissimilar to the last round of questions. One of the things that's interesting that I notice, uh, particularly from non-English speaking, native and English speaking members of the board, the concern about introduction of persuasiveness and as the complexity of that term. And I don't know if that, that has anything to do with it, it being for a non-English speaker and the risk that we do in introducing languages for non-English speakers. So something at least to explore Bob, as you, you go down that road, and at least to be sensitive to that, uh, because new terminology has a tendency of that risk. Um, again, concerns about undue complexity, which clearly we're trying to avoid in our standards. Um, but uh, again, uh, in general, some, some real support for, with caveats to going to exploring the principles that you're describing here. Uh, I'm conscious of time, and I know we're getting to, we're, we have a few, couple more things to go. One of the benefits of a clear paper is that uh, I think people understand the issues that are being raised in them. And the next section where you talk about the information produced by the entity and information sources, external entity is one of those sections that's clearly Fine. So maybe if we could go straight to the question and then we can invite comment and assume the paper is read and understood. If there are points of clarification that are being sought, people could raise their hand physically and then we'll get that and then move. But I don't think we have, we need, to, I think we need to jump right into the questions if we're going to get finished. That, that's fine, Tom. I, I would like, if you will allow, I, I, there is one uh, couple of things I'd like to respond to because I felt there was some. Uh, perhaps lack of understanding, uh, particularly around the auditor generated information, which came up uh, quite a few times. And I, I just want to clarify um, where, where the working group is coming at that from. Um, and maybe the best way to do that is by way of an example where perhaps uh, the auditor in a retail situation is using something like a regression analysis. Uh, as their evidence to support the reported revenue per store um, in an entity. And, and they may very well get, for example, square footage information internally from the entity. They may obtain economic growth ec uh, information from an external source. But the actual evidence that's being used to support the numbers is something that's generated by the auditor 
by taking that information and doing something with it. So I think we need to explore further the intersection and interaction with ISA 220 um, on those types of, of procedures. But just to be clear for the board, uh, the working group did feel there is a third category um, in addition to that concept. So um, with, with that, yes, let's, uh, Tom, certainly uh, we can move. I think the, the section in the issue paper on the sources of information is fairly brief. Uh, anyway, we have talked about this a little bit, so I'm very happy to move to uh, question four. Great. Uh, thanks, Tom, and thanks that I have the opportunity uh, to jump in. I have one, one question. Uh, uh, if we uh, eliminate uh, the concept of auditor generating evidence, uh, does that mean that the results of audit procedure and auditor conclusions in certain areas are not audit evidence? That's my question. Thanks. Bob, do you want to take that? I think, uh, I think Kai uh, reflects the, the working group consider concerns about that type of, of implication. As I said, we have to explore that further, better articulated. I'd also point out, you know, we don't have indicative drafting or anything here. Uh, so these are our concepts explained at a fairly high level uh, and we can look at more closely. Okay, uh, Yosh. Thank you, Chair. I have just one comment. Uh, Brett, one well, first bullet. It is important to determine whether the information obtained can be used as audit evidence in order to design any audit procedure by deciding its nature, timing, scope. I understand that it does not necessarily mean the external information is more reliable. However, in evaluating the degree of credibility, which is one of the attributes at issues paper page 14, for evaluating the reliability information, the auditor will focus on the difference in information sources in terms of whether to be under the control of the audited company or not. This is not the distinction between whether the information is produced by the audited company or not, but rather whether it is obtained from outside of the influence of the audited company. So it seems to me that it is better to maintain the distinction between internal and external sources of information from which the auditor obtained. That it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rich? Thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, just a couple small points. Um, so um, one of the, when we look at the internal versus external point as to whether you remove the distinction, I have to say when I first read that, I was not particularly happy with it, but I, when you read everything together, I started to see where you're trying to get to. And to me, it comes down to how, how clear what's replacing it is, is in both the application material and requirements. So uh, I'll leave it as just a, we need to make sure that it, it comes across right. Um, the, one of the other areas is just, the, again, as I said before, documentation. I'm just worried about how this all flows on to what needs to be documented. And, mm -hmm. and we don't want to get this huge uh, um, ex extra amount there. Um, and, um, and then the, the question about, and again, it's back on drafting, um, um, making sure it's tight enough so, because anything we try to then say how, how it's done in application material is not going to get you out of the requirements. So it's really important that the requirement is tight uh, to the point, covers what we're trying to get to, but it doesn't uh, bind us in a, in a way that we don't want to get to. Thanks a lot, Tom. Oh, sorry. Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Fiona. Thanks, and this is my last uh, reasonably substantive comment. Um, I've got minor ones on the rest of the paper, but that's fine. But this one in particular, I, and it started fairly earlier on in the paper, I think paragraph 14, where you make the comment that um, the scope of the information sources external to the entity is not the same or limited to the scope of the external information source, so EIS. And uh, I don't really follow why that is. I thought Rich might have raised it given it was a, EIS was the concept we agonised over with 540 and 
I think we even might have had a conversation at the time. Do we bother changing 500 as part of 540 or should we wait? And pretty confident I was on the wait camp. Um, but I, I'm just not clear on exactly what it is you're actually proposing. And, and I find it hard that 540 is really only just applicable and now we're wanting to change it again and reopen it. And that concerns me a little bit as well because that will create confusion in the practice. Um, so that's my last substantive comment on the paper. Thank you. Julie? Thank you. And, and Bob, it's, it's kind of just to reiterate a point I made, I think, in question three, which is, um, while I think treating the information under a similar umbrella for evaluation purposes, I think there still is a distinction based on source. So I wouldn't want to remove that distinction because I think that um, how you evaluate that will be different based on where, where the information is coming from. So a little bit to my point in um, question three and as well in this section, you um, refer to having some application material that deals with you know, access to some inform access to some information you might need um, for external sources where that might not be easily attainable by the auditor. And I just caution that because if we went down that route, it might steer auditors away from pursuing more external information because they feel there's a higher hurdle to cross uh, to obtain, you know, information about the reliability and reliability really at the end of the day. So uh, just, just some caution there on that point. Thank you. Great, uh, Sashka. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, similar to my comment on question three. I, I agree with the proposal. There is no distinction, but it's very important that uh, the application material provide sufficient guidance on work effort for internal and external, um, particularly around uh, challenges relating to external information. For example, I heard that there is uh, challenges in how to uh, address information external to the entity that is available to the auditor, but re reliability of such information is not determinable. And with regard to uh, access to information, maybe it's my bad reading, but it's not clear to me what paragraph 59 in the agenda paper in intends to mean, particularly it states irrespective of the outcome of the board discussion on this matter, working group proposed to clarify in the application material that the scope of ISO 500 address situation where the auditor is able to gain access to information. But I think some guidance is necessary around when there is no access to the information, but the auditor determine it's necessary. That's all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Roger. Yeah, my, my comment, uh, Bob, is probably um, a little bit more general and it's uh, around uh, just the internal sources of information and grouping everything together as, as you have. Um, uh, and it includes work of management experts um, and, and the types of credits we can get where we've got a true independent, uh, true expert in some of the areas and trying to encourage, encourage them, uh, encourage management to get the best available people to help source of that. So uh, I, I don't really want to lose benefits or the credits that could be aimed uh, for, for using management experts. Apologise if this is not exactly on the scope, but it's. Uh, I just wanted to raise that point. Okay, uh, that's the last of that round of, of comments. About I turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. I think um, um, good questions pick up on the, the documentation. The other uh, aspect is that the whole uh, checklist mentality. The the working group is very acutely tuned into that. Um, that issue, which is is why it was put forth, and, and maybe it's too nuanced. As I said, we don't have words that we've drafted um, at this point, so it's a little bit difficult. But the intent was that the the work effort required around evaluate runs to um, relevance and reliability, um, and that the auditor does that by considering um, factors. Um, and some of which will be applicable and relevant, some of which may not. But at the end of the day, the, the work effort is to evaluate whether it's sufficiently rely, relevant and reliable for the auditor's purposes. Uh, so clearly, we've got some work to do around that. 
uh, but uh, certainly take that um, into account. Um, so we will um, uh, continue to work through that. Um, you know, Sachiko, I, I think uh, just to address your point, that's I think for further consideration, uh, this access issue, it really is a scope uh, creep issue, I think, for this project. Uh, the working group was trying to articulate in paragraph 59 that um, that the standard or what we were working on was relevant to any information that the auditor has obtained. If there was information the auditor determined they should obtain but couldn't access, that that really gets into scope limitations, scope restrictions, and may be better dealt with elsewhere um, in the standards than in an audit evidence standard. So uh, we can we can try to draw that out more clearly uh, from that perspective. Um, so with that, Tom, um, I, I think actually the same approach works pretty well for the final issue. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. If, if we could just go to the next issue, really, I can boil this down um, to the question really being um, whether the, the auditor needs to do as much work or be as concerned with the reliability of information that's used when performing risk assessment procedures, as might be the case if they are assessing the reliability of information used in a substantive procedure or a response uh, to an assessed risk of material misstatement is really the question is really what the issue boils down to um, in this context. Uh, you can see what we, the, uh, issues paper as articulated here. Um, I would point out the technology work, uh, working group had issued uh, some non-authoritative uh, non paper on this topic um, earlier, and, and certainly we're, we're using that aware of it and will be incorporated here. Uh, but Tom, given the, the time, I'm happy to turn it back to uh, question or responses from the board on this final issue. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, question five. Uh, Using information for different types of audit procedures. Uh, any anyone want to take the lead here? Rich, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Tom. So uh, first, um, you know, again, thanks, uh, Fiona, for raising the point that I I had spotted but uh, didn't want to bring up uh, or is convinced not to bring up uh, about EIS. Um, you know, it was something I, I, I thought was a little strange considering we had just uh, done that. But Bob, to be fair to Bob, Bob it was always from the perspective of don't put it in here, I'm gonna be doing a project. So, you know, uh, um, I, I, do, I do appreciate that. But um, so like the, the last two times, uh, Bob, documentation again concerns me in this, this area, um, uh, it, probably even more so uh, in this area. If, you know, if we have to evaluate relevance and reliability for every piece of information and then obviously document all that, you know, there's, there's a point on how, how far. Um, and so I, I, I think we obviously got to find the right balance when you go through this uh, topic. Um, you know, maybe it's the degree to which the auditor is going to rely on it because that's, that's an important part. I mean, you'd have one thing if there's many different types of evidence that you have supporting something. And so you know, different amount of degree, if there was only one piece of evidence or one person who gave you the uh, advice, well, then you have to obviously think about it, document more to, to, to that point. So I can see how that uh, might change and maybe that's a way to, to look at it. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, and Bob, it's just a, um... It triggered, triggered some thoughts when you were talking in this question about the nature of the audit procedure, because I think that is one challenge that we heard on feedback, right, was that this distinction between risk assessment and further audit procedures is maybe being a bit blurred these days. And uh, so I was wondering if instead of tying this point to the nature of the audit procedure, it could be tied um, either as well or in replacement of the importance uh, to the audit procedure. Because if you're making significant judgments based on this information, I think that rises to a level of importance that probably dictates the work effort 
Whereas if it's, you know, one piece out of 10 that you're considering, maybe that work effort and the nature of your procedures is quite different. So just, just a thought there on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josephine? Uh, thank you, yes. Um, to this, I feel to some extent, I think Julie covered this in the last point um, about the being subject to the same work effort. I agree that we need to look more into the nature of the um, procedures. I think, as I said earlier, I keep saying I think we need more on the 315 piece. I also think we need more on the 220 piece. And despite your comment on order to gener generate information, your clarifications, what the working group said, I do still think we need to look at that uh, QM piece and the also the ISQM1 piece and how that fits into the whole order evidence piece. But to this point exactly, um, I actually um, don't think we should say subject to the same work effort because, um, because of that spectrum piece. And so it, I suppose I, I'm, I'm in the same camp as Julie on this. I do think in all cases, you have to evaluate relevance and reliability. I do think that it doesn't say that in paragraph seven today. I do think we need a more robust uh, requirement there, but we have to recognize that the work effort will be different to get to, um, to meet or to be in compliance with that, um, that requirement notwithstanding, of course, Richard's concerns over documentation. So in, in, I agree in making the requirement more robust. I don't think it is the same work effort. I think it would be different in, to meet the requirement depending on the nature of the procedure. And I still would like to focus on the nature of the procedure as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else on question five? I don't see any. Uh, Bob, uh, I turn it back to you. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for those comments. Um, I get the, uh, certainly hear the, the work effort uh, issue and, and Rich, your, your concerns around documentation. I think um, what I take away personally anyway uh, from the discussion today is that we need to focus on um, first of all, making sure that we're responsive to what we heard in our outreach um, and, and our research gathering phase, which was that our stakeholders were asking for uh, guidance or, or help to help them understand what it means to have sufficient appropriate audit elements. Uh, so there's, to be responsive to that, there is some degree of of further explanation or detail that, that we'll need to get into. I think it's um, what I heard was the struck, the construct that the working group has used where the work effort is to evaluate relevance and reliability by considering factors or attributes is not coming through clearly. And maybe it's because we haven't got the drafting done or whatever it is. Uh, but the second piece of that, and, and I hear the, the spectrum, and some have said, well, it's not the same work effort. I, I agree. Maybe that's the terminology that we're using. But the fact is, when you look at the factors and attributes, for example, that we included in the table here, I think the working group acknowledges that depending on the source and the specific piece of information you're looking at, some of those factors may not be relevant. Um, some may carry more weight than others, but the work effort at the end of the day is to require an evaluation of relevance and reliability. How you go about that uh, is, uh, you know, the, the attributes and factors are meant to be considerations that help you in that evaluation. Um, there was, as is stated in the paper, there was no intent. For those to be a checklist, I think we always run the risk in a standard uh, when you list out some considerations that they turn into checklists uh, for auditors. I, you know, we'll, we'll need to deal with that. But I, I just on this these last points, I think the important aspect is um, with 315 now, we do have a requirement that you obtain uh, sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support your, your risk assessment. So we still do have the question about what does sufficient appropriate audit evidence mean or look like in a risk assessment mode. Josephine, I, I agree 
totally. We need to look deeper into 315, 220, ISQM1, uh, and we can do that. The, the working group attempt uh, here was, again, to use the construct of considering the attributes and factors um, and recognizing that some cases they may be relevant. Uh, some cases, one factor might carry more weight than the other. And then maybe lost a little bit or maybe coming through too subtly here is that uh, particularly with this last issue, it was all couched in um, what's sufficient appropriate for the auditor's purposes. Uh, so I think what the working group was trying to get to there was if the, if the evidence is gathered for the purpose of assessing a risk, that perhaps the work effort to evaluate whether it's sufficient appropriate comes is looked at through a different lens uh, with respect to that. So I think we've got some work to do around making that more crisp, uh, bringing it out uh, in that regard, and maybe referring to it as work effort, which is shorthand for the issues paper, is something we really need to avoid um, as we move forward to starting to drafting. So uh, Tom, that, those are my reactions, I guess, uh, to the last topic. Uh, in particular, um, uh, I guess just, just to kind of close off, um, we, we don't have anything specifically in here uh, with respect to a timeline or, or a forward plan. We, we have that overarching plan in the project proposal, of course, uh, but uh, much of the way forward here was dependent on the feedback and the guidance we got from the board today as to uh, going back and looking at these and picking up some new issues back in March. Um, I'm happy to say that's all in good hands. We'll be handing the, the chair uh, of hopefully the task force over to Sue uh, to take this forward, working with Phil and, and uh, uh, Jasper and Natalie. Uh, so the, we'll certainly reconvene on these issues um, and, and go back and, and uh, take a closer look at the concerns that were raised. But I think Overall, I heard a lot of support for exploring these issues and, and keeping working on these uh, and refine them uh, based on the direction of the board. So I certainly appreciate that. Back to you, Tom. Thanks. Uh, Karen started to drop off, but she just reiterated the PIOB's uh, support for this project and uh, looks forward to monitoring our progress. Uh, Jim, Dalkin, any comments? From what you heard or from what you recall from the CAG meeting. Thanks, Tom. And the CAG has been supportive of this project. Uh, certainly, if you think about where we are and some of our auditing during COVID times, there are some implications probably on audit evidence and considerations of electronic data and the importance of reliability that, that um, Bob just mentioned. Thank you. Okay, any other closing? thoughts on uh, audit evidence, any hands? Okay, um, I'd like to share so, some good news uh, at this time of pandemic. It's always good to have a new doctor in the house. And I wanted to congratulate, congratulate uh, Lynn Provost for, for receiving an honorary doctorate of, as a doctor of commerce this week from Victoria University of Wellington. So congrats. Lynn. So that, that was really a nice piece of news uh, for us and uh, super. A uh, couple of, uh, <laughs> a couple of uh, administrative items and just to that on minutes, uh, Billy, what's the status of minutes? Because everyone's looking forward to approving them tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, uh, Tom, so we've got two sets of minutes. We've got the minutes uh, for the September board meeting and we've got the minutes for the November 10 and 11 uh, calls that we had. Um, so there was, we've really only received up to date one correction in the November minutes. That was just a, about the consistency of the use, or so, sorry, consistency in terms of referencing to the PI task force. Uh, we haven't received any um, uh, changes to the September minutes. So we are ready to post uh, the updated November minute. Um, Jim, if we can maybe just ask if you can just confirm um, on both sets of minutes whether you've got any changes, because as soon as you can confirm to us you're happy with the 
CAG sections in both those sets of minutes. Uh, we can post those minutes and then we can continue to approve them. Jim? Uh, you just not acknowledge it? Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, we, we will, I will do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments before? Remember, we're reconvening this afternoon, my time, uh, to talk about LCE, uh, that go to the issues paper. It is a two-part discussion. We have a long evening break afterwards. We, then we'll do it again on Friday morning. Uh, so we'll try to get through as much of the, the issues papers as possible. Uh, that uh, Bev, are, are you on the call right now? Do you wanna, you or, or Kai, do you wanna set up the conversation and any mindset that you want board members to bring to that discussion later? Maybe I'll leave it to Kai just to see if he wants to say anything, but nothing for me to add. Thanks. Mm, yeah, nothing special. It's just uh, as uh, as I said on Monday, we won't go through all the details of the standard. But we we're looking for some specific feedback on the questions that are in the issues paper. So that's information we would need in order to bring uh, bring the standard forward to the March meeting. So, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, great discussions this morning. Good progress. We stayed on time too, uh, despite a lot to be talk, discussed. Um, early stages in both efforts. So a lot to come back again on. So I'll see you later this today. Uh, we discuss LCE and thank you very much and speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.